Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the MEA board meeting for July 5th, 2012. Hopefully, everyone had a great 4th of July and is somewhat relaxed, given that we have a pretty long agenda tonight. Uh, so why don't we delve right into that with item one, board announcements. Not seeing any this evening. Uh, welcome, Diane. Good to see you in here tonight. Um, item two, public open time. Barbara George. Well, this is a, just a quick update on the uh, nuclear situation. It's looking more and more like Santa Monica is uh, down to the camp. <laughs> That's going to make um, the new initiatives that we have going on on energy efficiency even more important. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens with that over the Great, thanks, Barbara. Any other members of the public? Items not on the agenda? Sure. Okay. Sean. 30 seconds. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Sean Marshall, City of Mill Valley. Good to see you guys. It's been a little while. Um, I wanted just to let you know that um, the Brent Energy Authority, once again, is being held up as a national model for CCA. The um, City of Chicago is looking to that it looks like they're going to be running a ballot initiative for municipal aggregation in November. And we are working with city staff to really help them push the envelope um, in the Midwest to have a project or a program that looks a lot more like MEA or the East Coast. And it's also good to note that there are about 20 communities up and down the state of California that are in various uh, phases of CCA investigation and the state of New Jersey finally is, um, after all these years, getting started. So look for an, e an email in your inbox, but um, things are happening around the country. Thanks, Sean. That's great news. And, and definitely keep us abreast uh, frequently on what's happening out there. It's really helpful. Will do. Yeah. So thanks. Everybody's talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> Chicago and, and New Jersey, no less. Okay. Wow. Um, item three, report from Executive Officer Bob. Great. Um, so there, there are a number of things going on, but most of them are on the agenda tonight. So I just have one thing to report under this item, and that is that we have been working with the Technical Committee to develop a resource plan, a Renting Energy Resource Plan. And I just wanted to um, touch on the process that will be used to um, get this um, moved forward. They, the initial outline has been circulated to technical committee and was discussed at our last meeting of that committee. Uh, the same out outline has also been included in your board packet uh, under this item, so you can review it. If you have any comments or questions, let me know. We'll be working internally with our technical team to get this uh, fully developed, and we'll be bringing um, some more detailed information to a technical committee meeting in August. And the ultimate goal for this resource plan will be to bring it to our board retreat, which we typically hold every year in the fall. We're looking to hold the uh, board retreat this year in uh, September, either in the second or third week of September. Um, you can uh, stay tuned. Uh, Sarah will be sending out uh, information about that, um, making sure that we can find a date that works for everyone. But we will be discussing the resource plan um, at that meeting. And uh, we're, we're really excited about um, getting this um, uh, in the kind of back to the public for discussion. We, we spent a lot of time talking about the resource plan. We were developing our initial implementation plan, and this is kind of an excerpt um, pulling out of that implementation plan of, that um, is just going to be a little more fleshed out for us and uh, brought to uh, our current status where, where we have uh, a lot of customers to serve in the coming years. So um, let me know if you have any feedback or questions on that, and that's it for my report. Any other items? Oh. oh, great. Okay. Uh, any questions for Don? Mm -hmm. Board members, members of the public? Okay, great. Uh, item four, consent calendar. Okay, everyone had a chance to review that. Uh, I'll ask if the board has any questions or comments. Seeing none, uh, I have a motion. So moved. Second. All in favor of approving the consent calendar? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That matter carries. Okay, maybe we're going faster than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> okay, item five. Uh, 
bittersweet item. Uh, we're going to be discussing a resolution uh, honoring MEA board member Chris Martin uh, in town of Ross, who has just been a stellar uh, part of our board from day one. And I've actually called on, and Director Martin, you're here, right? Okay, there you go. <laughs> Uh, I've called on Director Ripkind to uh, read a resolution. So, uh, Chris, I have to <laughs> what I'm reading this about you have to be, you have to be in visual range. Whereas the Marin Energy Authority is a joint uh, powers authority established in December 19, 2008. I got the right resolution. Okay, you don't want me to, you want me to start at each one? They have a history. In Larkspur, in Larkspur we do this, but I'll, I'll go. Okay, but I'll go down to the part where it's just about you, Chris. How about, uh, I'll start right here. Thank you. Good uh, Whereas with Director Martin's advocacy and leadership, the Marin Energy Authority launched the California's first community choice aggregation program on May 7, 2010 providing renewable, non-polluting energy in Marin County, thereby dramatically reducing damaging greenhouse gas emissions. And whereas Director Martin has been a dedicated and determined public servant, demonstrating considerable perseverance to ensure that the town of Ross residents and businesses have the opportunity to choose Marin clean energy. And whereas Director Martin was a persistent and ultimately successful advocate with the town of Ross leadership, which voted to join Marin Energy Authority in October 2011. Thank you, Chris, for your good work there. Whereas Director Martin represented his Ross constituents skillfully and effectively as a member of the Marin Energy Board of Directors, and has always been a good nature, that's important, and reliable member, generous with his time, offering his objective analysis of issues along with thoughtful and constructive solutions. Whereas Director Martin's colleagues will sincerely miss him and as many contributions as him or humor, collegiality, energy, and his supportive and encouraging attitude. And the Board of Directors and staff sincerely thank Director Martin for his passion and commitment to the agency, its goals, and its purpose. And so now, therefore, be it resolved and ordered that by the Board of Directors the Marin Energy Authority, uh, that the MEA Board and staff do hereby extend to Christopher Martin our sincere and grateful appreciation for his unwavering and dedicated service to the MEA Board of Directors, and our best wishes to him and for continued success, happiness, and really important, good health in the years to come. Chris, we have a little something for you. Yeah, words really can't express how big you've been for the agency. Thank you. Uh, just, Thank you. We've been through a lot of battles, and, and you've been one of the main reasons for the success. So here you go. Thank you very much. All right. I just want to say that I've, I've been honored to serve with, with all of you and to work with staff. Uh, I'm going to miss this, JP. I've, I've found it to be certainly the most uh, interesting, the, the most valuable one to our community and the residents. And, and obviously, its, it's mission is a strong one that will be uh, very apparent in this county for, for many decades. And uh, I just want to thank you for all your good work. And by the way, um, you should know this is my second resolution. <laughs> <laughs> so I may come back for a third. <laughs> But I, I look, uh, By the way, we forgot about it. <laughs> Sean did. But I look forward to oh, the first time. former board members like Sean and Lou and Barbara and others that can be in the community. Thank you.
What is it, Jordi? It is. It says Chris. Thank you from all of us at NEA, and there's three of them over here. Actually, why don't we continue and Jordi, so he can. Uh, That's fine. Okay, great. We'll get to that. May I make a comment before? Yes, Carla. Ask for a, to, a small. Adopt, or to adopt the resolution. Yes, absolutely. Um, I just want to say, as coming in to fill in for Chris, uh, he's leaving a very large hole at the town of Ross. And he has represented all of you extremely well. And, um, and it's really through his efforts that um, the town of Ross joined MEA. And um, I will do my best. I'm not going to be able to totally fill your shoes, but I will do my best and just want you to know how much the town of Ross appreciate you and BJ for your contributions. And, and thank you. And Cher, we also have a, a swearing in um, for the new director, which we can do now. Okay. Great. I, Carla Small. I, Carla Small. Do solemnly swear or affirm. <clears throat> do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States, that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of California, and the Constitution of the State of California, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California and the Constitution of the State of California that I take this obligation freely that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties and, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Upon which I am about to enter. Thank you, Thank you. very much. I welcome the Lord. Okay, item six, um, audited financial statements for fiscal year 2011-12. Yeah, I can introduce this this item. Um, this is this is really just an informational item to um, inform the board that our audited financials were completed this past week, um, and I've made a couple of um, you know quick notes between uh, last year and this year. We've obviously had a lot of growth. Last year reflected only a partial year, um, partial year of operations. Um, ending in fiscal year 2011, and then ending in fiscal year 2012 to start first full year of operations, though not at full rollout. Um, and so we've, saw, we've seen a lot of growth in net assets, um, and obviously in customers as well. But if, if there's any questions, I can help to field them, yes. I do. Um, page 12, account receivable. 2011 shows we had an allowance for uncollectible accounts of 144,000 and change. You know how much we actually lost and didn't, or failed to collect in 2011, or is this the number? I don't have. I don't have the answer for that. I can. can, can I can talk to our accountant. Though. Can you get back? Yeah, get back to us on that. But only because it, that's a lot of money, and, and maybe that's standard in the industry. But this year we're up to almost two hundred thousand dollars. It seems like when when it's turning the lights on and off, that money ought to be collected for the most part. Yeah, certainly. And, like and, understand. and also, when it, in the paragraph underneath, so it, our initial reserve for last year's uh, for last year's financial statements. We had assumed a 1% uncollectible, but based on experience, um, you know, since we hadn't had enough operating experience to truly know, uh, for this, for the present year, for the 2012 fiscal year, that was reduced to one half of 1%. And as we move forward, as we enroll the remainder of our customers, as we enroll new loads from Richmond and so on, um, I, you know, we'll be able to refine those numbers and have you know, more operating history to determine what that should be. Great point. I, would, I would add that, you know, the half percent, that's roughly in line with PG's uncollectible rate. We actually did some research um, a couple of years back uh, in coming up with the initial estimates of what a reasonable uncollectible factor would be. And if I recall, their uncollectible rate is about 0.3%. Mm -hmm. 
uh, we're using 0.5 percent, pretty pretty close. So uh, it's, you know, it seems to be pretty low in line with. It's still a pretty low rate if you, if you think about 0.3 percent. Uh, but that's that's the basis for the numbers. Thank you. Any further questions for Beth? Members of the public on this side. I just have a, a couple of questions, if I may, Chair. Of course. All I'm trying to do um, is to be able to discern how many customers were served under each of these budget years. So what I'm looking at is um, page three, and then also just comparing to the year-to-date uh, monthly budget that you put out, Beth. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I know that, for example, in 2011, with the operating revenues, we were, MEA was serving about, what, 5,500 customers that year? I'm trying to get a sense of the, the growth of the revenues vis-a-vis -vis the number of customers served in each of those years. Because mm -hmm. it's jumped from 22.9 um, to now the budget in the coming year of 58.3. Is that anticipating full rollout? So in, I'm sorry, can you say, you can say that again? Sorry, so in, so in 2012, you have operating revenues of 20, you know, basically 23 million, mm -hmm. right, to round up. Yeah. And that's serving how many customers? Because right now, MEA is at what, 14 something? Yeah, that's actually at 13.9, um, if you take a look at page four. Okay, cool. And then, but now in your current budget year, mm -hmm. you've got a total annual budget of 58 million. Correct. But that's not necessarily the, the total budget at full rollout. Right? No, certainly not. And so, and if you will see in the staff report um, that I provided for the budget comparison schedule, it notes that you know there's there's certain costs that are front loaded and certain costs that are back loaded, and so our revenues and energy costs are being back loaded in the year since enrollment is happening now. Yeah. Um, and then certain communications costs have been front loaded, um, and so that certainly does not reflect the entire year because it essentially misses out on uh, April, May, June, and essentially half of July since the enrollment happens over the course of over the course of the month, mm -hmm. oh, pursuant to people's meter read dates. Um, so next year, what will be reflected is, you know, beginning April 1st of 2013, then we'll be looking at full rollout within the bounds of Marin County, but it's not going to reflect the full rollout, for example, of Richmond. Richmond and so I, I think that, you know, when you're looking at the trajectory and, and sort of in field of numbers, I mean, I think that you're going to see, you know, very different growth. It's not going to necessarily be... And then you a useful yes. metric like yeah. sort of a business that's been okay. You know, it, so are you guys able to say that then for this current budget of fifty eight thousand? What I hear you saying is that is not necessarily the budget for the existing customer base because that customer base is getting ready to really greatly expand. Yeah. So, so what this is what this is reflecting is this reflects an annual budget, right, and not a monthly budget. And so when you're looking at the different you know actual budget figures, like for example, you'll see that our, our revenue and our cost of energy are well below the budget because those are backloaded in the fiscal year. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but this is this is intended to comprise you know our entire needs the current fiscal year, including all the different rolling main costs. And okay. This was taken call later, I promise. Yeah, no <laughs> problem. I understand. understand. I will go many calls. Okay. Okay. So, thank you. And I'm not an accountant. I'm just a lawyer. <laughs> so, but I'm you do a heck of a job. <laughs> okay. Any uh, further questions or comments on this item? Looks like it's just a discussion item, is that correct? Yeah, because it's already been certified by the accountant service. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah. Okay, item seven, uh, resolution uh, approving the revised MEA CCA implementation plan and statement of intent. This could be you, Don. Yeah. Um I'm going to introduce this, and, um, and John Delessi may also weigh in. Um, we, as, as the board knows, we have been um, working with Richmond to add them to the Marine Energy Authority, and last month your board approved their 
the request from the city of Richmond to become part of the MA board. Um, part of what is needed to complete this process is to update the implementation plan and um, uh, make some, uh, some related changes and submit the updated implementation plan to the CPUC for certification. So uh, what we have before you this evening is a revised implementation plan and statement of intent um, and a resolution that, um, uh, that approves the revised um, implementation plan and statement of intent. The, the primary changes here are to reflect the addition of the city of Richmond, um, that makes some changes to many of the charts that are included in the plan um, and also have, has some related impacts on um, buildings. So I'm going to turn it over to John to um, yeah, well, I don't have a whole lot more to add uh, to that. Most of this is just to you know, conform the plan to the addition of the new customers uh, and, and lay out a little bit, a little bit of uh, what the plan and what the schedule is for those customers in the city of Richmond. There were a couple of also updates um, since you know, the passage of time. A few things have changed that were reflecting the plan. We try to minimize changes, uh, uh, but uh, things like you know, Increase the renewable content for the default light green product to 50 percent. It used to be 25 percent. So we made those types of updates as well. But the, the vast majority of the changes are really just um, reflective of the addition of the city. Mm -hmm. Why don't one of you touch on the governance issues? I know that's come up a couple times in the public recently. And just how that change governance uh, spelled out. Yeah. So. Um, as, as your board is aware, we do have a weighted voting system that is used and uh, that could be used from time to time when we have um, votes that are not unanimous on, on, on our board. And um, the, the vote is, 50% um, of it is attributed to one member, one vote. The remaining 50% is attributed to the proportional share of energy usage um, in our load within that jurisdiction. So. Um, the city of Richmond uh, is coming in at about 17% uh, for their voting share. Um, just to give you a sense of the scale of it, um, the city of San Rafael and the um, county of Marin both come in at about 13%. Um, the city of Nevada also is, is close to that, uh, 13%. Our smaller cities and towns come, are coming in at, at um, a smaller level. And we actually have the, uh, the voting shares included as uh, an exhibit. Um, as part of the updated plan, I believe it's Exhibit D. Those, uh, by the way, those um, voting share, the voting share ratio is updated periodically um, to conform to to actual usage in the city and town. And, um, so there, are, you know, depending on the, the opt-out rate in a given city and town, depending on whether a, a city or town opts its own municipal load out or not, ultimately that will have an impact on the. Uh, any comments? Yes, Tom. Question, John. Is this presentation of this to the CPUC pretty much pro forma, or are there objections that they could voice that would disallow it in some way? It, it actually is pro forma, and they're actually required to certify the plan within a 90-day time period. They typically turn it around within 30 days. Um, they are allowed to ask their plan questions and um, request some uh, administrative changes that we, we, um, we can respond to um, during the course of their review. But um, in general, it's a pro forma review that they do. And we will go through this process when we add any new customers in the future, is that correct? When we add a new jurisdiction, yes. Not when we add new customers within a jurisdiction. Um, when we added the new member agencies uh, after the votes last fall, Puerto Madera, Ross, Larkspur, and Novato, we updated our implementation plan at that time and um, resubmitted it to the CPUC for approval with those four new communities being added in. So this is very similar. This is really the same process that we're going through um, to add a new community. If, if we chose to expand further, we would need to go through this process again. Okay. Further questions? Director Redcott. Do we know when uh, we'll have our Ross, Ross excuse me, Richmond uh, representative uh, to yeah. start attending the board meetings? We will be able to have a Ross representative participate in the board meetings as soon as the implementation plan is certified by the CPUC. So depending on the length of their review, it's possible that we could have a, a director from Richmond sitting on the board at our very next meeting, which is our next regular meeting is scheduled for September, because we don't meet in August. 
and how the rollout of their customers would occur. So. Yeah, we would be offering service um, for deep green to customers ahead of, ahead of next April. Um, that would be offered uh, after the approval of the implementation plan. But the light green offering and uh, mass enrollment would not occur until April of 2013 at the earliest because we need to do additional procurement to serve that load. Members of the public on this side? And why don't we bring it back to the board? And this is a resolution. If I can have a motion. Move to approve. Um, resolution on February 16th. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That matter. Okay, item eight, resolution of the Board of Directors adopt, adopting amendment number five to the NEA Joint Powers Agreement to account for the City of Richmond. Okay, so this item is closely related to the last item on the agenda. As, <coughs> as part of adding the new member of Richmond, we need to make some adjustments to the Joint Powers Agreement, including adding uh, the City of Richmond to the list of parties, that's in Exhibit B. Also, um, making changes to the voting shares, which we just discussed, that's shown in Exhibit D. And um, these changes, we also need to include a signature page from the um, City of Richmond in our uh, overall master JPA agreement that is kept uh, on the file and posted on our website. So um, those are the changes that are uh, being recommended tonight, and they would allow us to include Richmond as part of our JPA agreement. Okay, seems pretty straightforward. Any comments or questions, Director Redcock? Is uh, members of the JPA? This is just a general question about JPAs. If anyone knows, is it limited only to uh, cities and counties, or can other governmental districts possibly? I'm thinking like sewer districts or community service districts or other, other governmental agencies where there's elected bodies. Yeah. It's limited to cities, towns, or counties. Okay. For the, under the CCA law. Correct. Yeah, although actually there was an, uh, there are two uh, others that have been <laughs> included uh, per SB 790. There are two water districts that were specified in that legislation um, that are now authorized to launch a CCA program, but none of those are in Marin. Yeah, and so that's sort of separate and apart from the Joint Powers Authority question, mm -hmm. which relates to sort of our group. Um, but yes, so there's, regarding CCA, there's beyond the cities, towns, counties, these specific water districts can also participate. I don't know if you can form a JPA with them. I would have to do research. Mm -hmm. Any further questions, members of the public on this item? Okay, bring it back. Uh, can I have a motion to approve resolution 2012-7? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, great. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Seven. Aye. 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 Item 9, MEA Energy Efficiency Program Implementation Plan for 2013 and 14. Great. So, um, since NEA Forum, we've been very interested in launching an energy efficiency program, and we worked very hard during the uh, calendar year 2011 to um, insert some additional language through legislative action in, in SB 790 that enables us uh, a little more um, access to launching and administrating, administering our own energy efficiency programs. Uh, after that, the legislation passed and went into effect January 1st. Our, our board um, uh, finalized and submitted an energy efficiency plan to the CPC for certification that was submitted on February 3rd of this year. Um, since that time, the CPC Energy Division and Legal Division uh, has been has reviewed our energy efficiency plan and they uh, requested that some adjustments be made. Um, partly because a CCA program has never applied for energy efficiency funds, and they were working on interpreting the statute and um, developing a, a process that would conform to their existing budget cycles and uh, address the, the concern that 
uh, many energy efficiency dollars have been allocated <coughs> for the current funding cycle. Those, the requested amendments were made to our plan and approved by your board in, at a special meeting in June. The um, revised plan was then resubmitted to the CPUC. And just this week, on Tuesday afternoon, a draft resolution was issued by the CPUC certifying our energy efficiency plan for 2012. And it's important to um, mention that this, the, this plan that was amended and, and uh, recently recommended to be, to be approved is just for the year 2012. The, um, the and we discussed that at the last meeting. We did, yes. We discussed it in detail at the special meeting. Um, what we're going to be discussing this evening is uh, a different proposal that will be submitted for the years 2013 and 2014. Um, but just to provide context, um, one, one last comment I'd like to make about the 2012 plan that was just recommended for approval is that there is a 20-day um, a period where protests can be filed um, regarding the certification of our 2012 energy efficiency program. The commission will then ultimately be voting on whether to approve our plan or not for 2012. And um, so we'll keep you posted on whether any protests are filed and what the outcome of that vote is. Um, if approved, as proposed in the resolution, uh, PG&E would be directed to, to um, send uh, revenue to us that has been collected by our customers for energy efficiency um, in the amount of $427,000 to be spent on our, our program for the remainder of 2012. So we'll keep you posted on that process. Um, just three weeks ago, a ruling came out from the CPUC regarding energy efficiency funds for the years 2013 and 2014. In this ruling, there was some very specific guidance for how CCA programs can apply for energy efficiency funds during this 2013-2014 um, cycle. This guidance had not been previously um, submitted. It really hadn't been thought through by the CPUC before. Um, so it's, ex it's extremely helpful to have this guidance um, in the ruling. Um, the, uh, the downside of the ruling is that it, it gave us um, no less than, uh, I think, 17 days to get a plan completed and submitted to them. The, the due date for this program implementation plan has been set for July 16th. And so uh, we have uh, a team of folks working fever feverishly to get this plan completed. Um, and. Um, have it ready for submittal uh, week from Monday. Um, this plan is going to be uh, more comprehensive and robust than the plan that we submitted for 2012. It's going to include uh, many more elements, and um, I'll, I'll walk you through what those elements are, and I'm happy to answer questions about it. Um, the, the other clarification I want to make before we get into the, the detailed components of the plan is that the um, the statutory language that we applied under for the year 2012 enabled us to provide an energy efficiency program um, to our customers only. The statutory language that we're referencing with the 2013-2014 plan allows us to apply for energy efficiency funding for all customers in our jurisdiction. We can even, we could even apply to serve customers outside of our jurisdiction, although there's not an interest in doing that currently. But we will be able to serve customers who have opted out. So this would be not just a marine clean energy program, but it would be an energy efficiency program for the Marine Energy Authority that would be serving all customers in Marin County and customers in Richmond. So we've been working closely with uh, the city of Richmond um, and the county of Marin on developing this program um, to make sure that we're um, building off of what already exists and, and leveraging what already exists. Now to get into the detailed uh, components of the program, the 2012 program is based on uh, one primary direct service element, which is multifamily outreach and direct service. So we would be uh, working with a third party vendor to do audits and retrofits in multifamily units. Um, some of the funding would be allocated for um, direct incentives um, for folks to make, change, make uh, upgrades and installations in multifamily units. This really is an underserved sector and our partnership with the Marin City Community Development Corporation has enabled us to really craft a program that is innovative and works very collaboratively from the ground up with um, community members um, that, um, that need the services. 
and we're looking forward to, to uh, providing the service, not just in the um, southern Marin area, but in other parts of Marin where there are multifamily uh, buildings. The, the um, program that we're envisioning for 2013-2014 would continue the multifamily element, but would also include direct service to specific uh, com commercial sectors, including restaurants, small retail, and commercial and small grocers like mini marts. Um, this uh, targeted approach will um, be useful in leveraging funds that are already available to customers, but also helping um, to do comprehensive audits and retrofits that don't, don't just uh, do the cherry picking where we're just doing lighting and then getting out of it, but we're trying to take a more comprehensive approach. We also will be working with the Marine Municipal Water District to um, include water measures when we're doing those audits so that there's um, a little more um, coming out of the audit than just energy efficiency measures. The water nexus is important to the CPUC, and we're fortunate to have a very strong partner here in Marin um, that can uh, work with us on, on conservation measures and um, supplying uh, added incentives that they already have available. We also are um, looking to potentially partner with the North Marin Water District as well in offering these programs. The other component of our plan, which is really exciting, is the financing element. And this really goes hand in hand with the direct service element because it enables um, the customers to have a mechanism for making a, a deep retrofit in their, in their building or their home. Um, we are looking at on-bill repayment as a mechanism for customers to um, initially invest in and then pay off over time uh, an energy um, modification to their facility. We're working with a partner that has um, uh, some, uh, some backing from the San Francisco Found Community Foundation um, to run a test program for on-bill financing in Richmond and in um, Marin County. And uh, we're looking at offering this program on a pilot basis to about 250 homes in Marin, about 250 in um, I'm sure we will. Um, we'll take the results from the pilot and, uh, and be able to um, incorporate them and hopefully make the program a little bit bigger. This is a nice um, way to, to allow for financing in lieu of a PACE program, but, but we are also interested in exploring PACE further to the extent that we can. Um, we are partnering with an organization um, that is a, a coalition of Bay Area organizations um, they're called a Regional Energy Network for the Bay Area, and they are submitting a proposal um, under the same um, parameters that we are submitting under, and uh, they are looking for PACE funding for uh, commercial facilities. And so we're going to work with them and allow them to take the lead on that because they have a comprehensive approach. Um, we may, however, explore the possibility of expanding and leveraging what they do and potentially offering a residential pace if some changes are made on the federal level that um, uh, are able to eliminate some of the barriers currently facing um, that, uh, that type of program. And the last program that I'll mention, this, this falls into the, the financing side, is the, um, the uh, standard offer for energy efficiency procurement. And this is a, a concept that's been brought to, a, to us by um, some um, advocates in the community, but also has a lot of uh, great, um, uh, there's some great examples of this type of program in other parts of the country. And so what we'd like to do here, again, is offer this type of program on a pilot basis. It really puts the, um, the third party vendor in the driver's seat to propose measures to us that will result in energy efficiency um, and savings to us, demand savings, capacity savings for us. And we can uh, pass that savings along to the third party vendors. Um, this type of program would be most attractive to large commercial customers, most likely. Um, but we're excited about offering this program, and it's also something that's um, of great interest to the CPUC uh, as they're kind of in an exploratory stage now wanting to test out um, new and innovative concepts. Um, so standard offer meaning that we would, we would make the offer and then the vendors respond to it? Correct. So that's an overview of our plan. Um, before we get into questions on the plan, just for context, I'd, I'd like to add well, one more piece of information, which 
takes us past 2013-2014. In the ruling that was issued by the CPUC about three weeks ago, there was some discussion about what would happen for energy efficiency programs in 2015 and beyond. Um, in particular, there was attention given to how a CCA program might apply for and administer um, an energy efficiency program from that point forward. And the rules that have been proposed are um, there's a specific request for comments to those rules and a longer uh, process of back and forth with the interested parties to really determine how CCA programs would, um, would address EE funding from 2015 and beyond. And so it seems to be the intent of the CPUC to follow the path that's been laid out very clearly for 2012, 2013, 2014, but then spend the time, the back and forth and debate that's going to happen with um, interested parties really focusing on how the rules are set for 2015 and beyond. We will certainly be weighing in on those rules and filing comments of our own in the fall, um, but right now uh, staff and our, our uh, consultant team is really focused on getting uh, this proposal submitted um, so that we can um, plan for a robust program in 2015. With regard to 1314, though, how is the fund, overall funding established for the various programs that are determined? Yeah, we believe that the CPUC will use a methodology that's similar to what they used in um, allocating revenue for the 2012 program. And what they did at that time was um, ask us for customer usage. Um, and just to give you a sense of the, the proportions here, they looked at our customer usage dating back to the day we submitted our plan on February 3rd. So they are um, counting dollars that were being that have been collected from our customers since that date. Um, that of course includes the added increase in number of customers that happens in July, going through the end of the calendar year. Um, all of all of that data went into coming up with this number that's a, a just over four hundred thousand um, dollars. Next, for the, the next two years, we would be looking at a program that goes beyond just our customer base. So they would be looking at um, usage for all customers in Marin County and Richmond. Um, but there may be some other filters or parameters that they apply to their analysis that we're not yet aware of. There's still some ambiguity with regard to how um, the statute is being interpreted for statewide programs, for example, um, statewide programs. Um, may or may not be excluded from um, the, uh, the types of programs that we can apply for and what really qualifies as a statewide, statewide program um, is uh, a little bit unclear. Um, but if they use a similar methodology to what we saw before, we should see um, a proportional increase in the dollars that are collected. The one other factor that's important to mention is that the mechanism that has been used historically for collecting energy efficiency dollars, particularly the public goods charge fund, has sunset it. And there's remaining dollars left over for this calendar year, and that's what's being used to um, maintain some of the existing programs and some of the programs that we've applied for. But those those funds will not exist um, starting in 2013. The CPUC has, um, because they are requesting proposals from so many parties on July 16th, um, it seems that there is a plan afoot to make sure there is a revenue stream and that there are energy efficiency dollars collected from customers. But what that plan is, what that mechanism is, has not yet been defined. Director Redpine. How'd you know I had a question? You already told me you do. <laughs> I always have questions. So, Don, thanks for, thanks for that report. So how do we make this, there's a lot of words and a lot of stuff, how do we make this easy if uh, the average uh, apartment owner in San Rafael wants to get involved and get an, an energy efficient audit and then get, and, and not just the bulbs as you talked about, but we're talking about the windows and the whole, the whole nine yards. And, and how, how's it re really going to work in practice? Give me an example. They're going to call up MEA and then what happens? And, who, and who's going to do it here of the lovely six people that are here? How's that going to work? Well, one of the lovely parts of the, the um, funding allocation is that um, our budget includes uh, one and a half um, positions. Um, we've actually, our board has already approved an energy efficiency position that's waiting to be filled and I'm waiting for the funding stream to emerge. Um, so we'll be, we'll be ready to make that hire um, as, as soon as August rolls around, assuming that the, um, the, the decision is voted out at the commission. Um, but what would happen from a practical standpoint is 
Um, and, and we can take calls, you know, as, as soon as, as possible, you know, as, as, if you all have um, folks that you think would be interested in some in an audit and a retrofit, multifamily buildings in particular, let us know. We're going to be doing, we've already done a lot of outreach to determine um, what facilities are in need and, and haven't been served before. Um, but we'll be looking, uh, we'll be working with the Housing Authority to um, identify other units. Um, and we'll be working with um, a, a third party vendor with the Marin City Community Development Corporation who's, who is going to be on the ground with us identifying interested parties. But um, the way it will work for an interested party is they'll contact MEA, they'll say, hey, I'm interested in uh, some energy efficiency services, or I, you know, I think I could bring my bill down, but I'm not sure, I'd, I'd like to have someone come and check it out. Um, we will send a, a vendor um, that will be under contract with MEA to their facility to do an audit, a comprehensive audit that will look at not just the, the thing they might bring up, the, the light bulbs or um, the HVAC, but uh, the audit will include a, a checklist of measures that will even include the, the water measures. For Is there a cost for the audit? The, the audit will be covered by um, our budget, so the initial audit will be covered. Um, they will identify measures and then the measures that are identified, some of them will have a cost associated with them. Um, many of them will have rebates associated with them, existing statewide program rebates or other rebates that are offered already um, through the CPUC. And those will be the, um, the, the folks doing the audit will be able to communicate that to the owner so that they can pick and choose which measures they want to implement. Um, our goal is to uh, work with the um, with the customer to identify measures that will result in at least a 10% decrease in energy usage. Those are considered cost effective. If they want to do other things for other reasons, sometimes there are cosmetics, hey, I really wish I could have a new this or a new that, and I'm willing to pay a little extra. Um, they can do that on their own, but um, we'll be working with them to identify the most cost effective measures. Thank you. Director Kim. Yeah, Dylan, explain the relationship uh, between the county's program which is run through the Community Development Agency using, I believe, funds that PG&E provides on our contract, is that right? And, um, do we coordinate the MEA program with the county's program? How does that work? Yeah, we've been working very closely with the county's program, particularly with Dana Ramonino and also a bit with Brian Crawford. Um, the, the good news is that the CPUC has a number of different um, relationships going that um, provide funding in multiple um, venues within the same jurisdiction. So for example, there are PG&E programs now operating in Marin County separate and apart from the county programs. There are county programs operated. Um, these are um, administered by, by PG&E. pg and &E is acting kind of as a, a middleman there, um, although they are CPUC funds ultimately that are being administered and passed through to the county. We will be yet another layer of program offering uh, here in Marin County. And to, to make it even more complex, I apologize, there's this Bay Area Renewable Energy Network that will be submitting a proposal um, at the same time we are. The county of Marin is participating with the Bay Area Regional Energy Network, um, and we are also participating. Because the Bay Area um, Regional Energy Network is specifically requesting funding for a multifamily program, that is one area where this um, BayREN, that's what they call themselves, the BayREN proposal will not include us in their multifamily ask. They will specifically leave us out as a partner on that section. All the other sections, the commercial pace, for example, um, we will be included as a program partner. We will actively market the commercial pace program and point to BayREN as the administrator of that program. So there's a lot of close collaboration um, our goal is to avoid the appearance or reality of duplication of services. We don't want it to. We don't want to set up a scenario where folks in Marin are getting extra services compared to other regions. Um, what what the CPUC is interested in right now, however, is innovative pilots happening during this this interim year, 2013-2014, and those. The success or failure of those pilots will inform what they choose to focus on in 2015 and beyond. Um, but that's certainly something that we could do, and, and that would probably be a good place to start. Okay. Chair? 
point of clarification. Yes. It's not the Marin City Community Services District, but the Marin City Community Development Corporation. Right. Just, just oh, yeah, some confusion in the language there. Excuse me. Yeah. The Director of Services. Director Collins. To Lynn's question, is there a cutoff in the number of people that can call and say I'd like an audit? Because it sounds to me like everyone would like an audit. Whether, right. they, whether they play or not, at least find out what, you know, what it would cost them and what they, what they can gain. So how will that be administered? Yeah, there is a, a certain level of uh, dollars that have been allocated for the audits themselves. So when that's depleted, the audits would then revert to costing money. Um, but it's something that could be covered, um, the cost could be directly covered by the customer at that point. But we do have quite a bit. I think that um, given the short term, uh, the, the short number of months remaining in 2012, um, we are going to be, um, I think we're going to have a lot of audits and we're going to be working hard to find interested customers. One thing that we've learned with energy efficiency programs is there's kind of a, um, a ball rolling down the hill effect where it takes a while to kind of get, get speed and get the word out and then you kind of hit a critical point where um, there's a lot of interest all at one time. And, um, with this program, given that we have five months um, to do it, we're going to need to work hard at the front end to, to get the ball rolling quickly. So you don't make the cut and the cut is well, yeah, um, but through the, the proposal that we're talking about this evening, we'll be looking for additional funding for audits for 2013 and 2014, and um, that should carry us uh, for many months. You mentioned, Dawn, a few minutes ago the PACE program, which we have discussed here off and on for at least two years. Are Freddie and Fannie still the major obstructions to that? And if so, why would you ever expect that to change? Um, yes, they, they still are um, the, the primary obstruction. In fact, there was a decision made about six weeks ago that, um, uh, that meant that they would no longer um, yeah. provide backing for any yeah. loan mm -hmm. that had a pace okay. assessment on it. So um, that actually is a step that was very discouraging for us in our consideration of a PACE program, and it has really tempered our interest in doing that anytime in the near term. Um, the, in Sonoma County, they have continued to operate their residential PACE program. And they just ignore the Fed, basically. Yeah. And, um, and thus far, there, ha there hasn't been a lawsuit. They haven't had any um, real material impacts from what's going on. But um, it is extremely um, concerning for the, for the launch of the does Sonoma include an efficiency side to their pace program? Yes. Interesting. And water measures. Further board questions or comments? Why don't we go to the public? Okay, soft hand. Yes. Should I stand up there? Absolutely. <laughs> and anybody say your name as well. Jonathan Cathry, I live in Mill Valley. Uh, I work for Wide Green Energy Fund, and we're currently starting programs in uh, Sacramento and the Miami-Dade area, we call it the Green Corridor. And both programs have at least a component of residential, so they're moving on. What do you on. do then? What does Y Green do? Sorry, Just Y Green so administers know. and funds PACE programs. So we bring a fully funded solution with private capital. So the Sonoma model is the most effective model nationwide with 50, uh, 50 million in funding, and they funded it through their own treasury. Uh, they had about a million of upfront costs to pay, and then they've um, started to deplete the money because it's all loaned out. It's popular, like uh, Mr. Collins said it is. So it, they've depleted most of their funds. We've come in um, as a solution to that. And uh, I'm happy to answer some questions, um, but otherwise just want to let you know. I'm What's your answers. overall assessment of, uh, to Director Crum on this point? They're protecting, the legal they're protecting their assets, FHFAs. That's our perspective. Um, the legal side, we don't know what the answer is going to be to it, but they can't stop us from funding or you from funding um, non-FHFA mortgages. So, but they've effectively stopped us from starting a PACE program. Right, and with most of the rest of the nation. Yeah. Uh, Sacramento's kicking off. It didn't stop Sonoma. Uh, and like I said, the Miami area is going forward. There's new law passed at the beginning of this year SB 555, which allows um, the, the PACE assessment to no longer be an assessment, it's a tax. I'm happy to get into more detail, um, but it makes it a more secure um, 
move for the, the county or the local jurisdiction? How popular mm -hmm. have um, on-bill financing options been so far? Um, well, we see PACE as a gap. Um, I don't know the exact popularity, and you know, it depends on how you measure it, but contractors say to us that, that we're a gap that fills the need between having upfront cash and signing up for other methods. We're, property, we're a property-based uh, financing, so it doesn't have to do with your credit score, and it doesn't have to do with things like uh, how much cash you have in the bank. We look at a few basic underwriting criteria that are the same nationwide, and it's, it's, th it's really three main things. It's are you current on your mortgage, are you current on your taxes, and are you bankrupt? And beyond that, we look at the property value, and it's such a small <coughs> amount of your property value, and um, it's interesting, Mr. Collins again said something at the beginning of the meeting about people not paying their property, uh, excuse me, not paying their electrical bill. We see, and case studies show, there's a study out by Berkeley um, that suggests that it's the first bill anybody pays anyway. It's such a small amount that it doesn't put an FHFA mortgage at risk. So we see it as sort of people learning the market and getting to see, understand basically. So it's kind of a big learning curve, which is all it really comes down to. As far as education, does, does the Sonoma program, does Sonoma keep the paper or do they lay it off after the I believe they keep it. But I don't have a 100% answer on that. And I think, I believe that that's where they've run into problems with finding more funding. There, yeah. So what's the security of that? Is, are you getting, for, for the money that your company is, is funding to get, to get the improvements? It's part of the tax system. So the security is the property. You, well, you say the security is the property, so is it indeed a trust? What, how you it's say? actually a tax. It's, a, it's the same as a, it's a Melrose Community Facilities Oh, district. I see. It's on the property tax bill. It would be a non ad valorem tax, just like a sewer district. Okay. Anyway, I'll be here and I'm, I can answer questions at the end. I just want to let you all know that I'm here to help. Thank you. Sean? One of the reasons that I'm so excited about your energy efficiency plan is that it seems like, uh, by our read, through this SB 555, the Community Assessment District requirement, I guess now, in the state of California, it would be worth checking to see if MEA basically satisfies that district re requirement because the jurisdictional boundaries are potentially the same. And so one of the things that Lean is looking at is how you, if you begin to integrate PACE, in this case, um, whether it's energy efficiency or solar PACE, with CCA to essentially offer a twofer. Um, in new communities. But since MEA is already up and running, it would be really interesting to think about this board essentially serving as the board of that community service district on behalf of PACE. I bet you might be able to do it. So it's worth checking. And that's at the residential uh, scale. Okay, any other uh, public comments? Barbara? What? Yeah, it's. Um really moving fast after not much has happened for a year and a half in the energy efficiency world. And uh, this is really um, very fuzzy. Uh, just for your information, what's going on uh, at the commission is that they allowed something called regional energy networks to, to um, come to the commission and make an application for funds for 2013-14. to uh, They didn't set any limits on the amount of funds that they could ask for. Um, there's, uh, so basically what's quite possible is that the, the utilities just uh, um, put forward their proposals for 2013-14 um, this Monday. So the commission wanted to have these regional energy network proposals um, around the same time so they can be considered together and it wouldn't postpone this decision. I think this decision is going to be contested um, seriously anyway. So we got rolled in, the CCA's got rolled in at the same time 
um, as a CCA, um, as this regional energy network. Uh, and apparently these are gonna be quite large um, chunks around the state. We don't even know, maybe there's gonna be all everywhere around the state. There was a discovery, there supposedly were gonna be a pilot in 2013-14. Um, but this is, you know, this is a you know, huge elephant that's about to come on to the stage. We have no idea what's, what's there because they've been keeping it very, um, you know, very quiet about you know, what's actually happening. Um, but the fact that there is no guidelines, um, financial guidelines, there was, there was some uh, very vague policy guidelines for what types of things regional energy networks could offer. Um, now, when you have the, the CCA um, cleanup bill, SB 790, uh, had a, um, actually pulled back somewhat from AB 117. AB 117 said a CCA can apply for their money. Um, of course, the problem was that the CPC allowed us to apply. Um, so then the SB 790 said you can elect to run an energy efficiency program but you can apply, you, you can elect to administer the funds um, except for statewide and regional programs. So statewide programs are 60% of the programs and those are the big things that the utilities are currently running. Um, maybe in the future those will be run by a state agency, we don't know. Then this regional, you know, energy, this shadowy regional thing came along, and so we don't know how much more of the money is going to be sopped up by them. Um, I, I just wanted to note that as far as the rest of the year of 2012, um, what PG&E has sitting there in their coffers as of the end of April, um, they had about $450 million out of a $1.8 billion um, budget. So the fact that we're getting 460,000 this year, I say, you know, well, okay, you know, because we didn't have the full um, complement of our customers, yeah, and they were only allowing us to apply for our customer funds rather than in the future we'll be able to apply for everybody in the county. Um, Okay, but I just want to, you know, like point out that they've got four hundred fifty million dollars. I'd like more of it. And as far as the coming years, I think that that we really need to aim high. They'll probably cut us back, but I think we need to ask for as much as we can possibly get. And I would say all of it. So what I'm hearing from Dawn, you know, this is insanely like rapid <coughs> to have to make this application for 2013-14 in 17 days. This is ridiculous. Um, <coughs> the commission, I don't know where they get off with that kind of schedule. Um, but I'm very concerned about this multiplicity of, of administrators because that really it hems us in to the extent that we are trying to work with <coughs> existing programs there's a lot less that we can do as an independent entity. And I just wanted to point out one of the things that I've been working on this week, um, the last few weeks, is <coughs> programs for the Edison territory to, to replace the power from San Onofre. And one of the things that we have noted is that you can, you know, in SMUT territory, you can get a rebate for air conditioning um, it's very clear, here's your rebate, you get a 10 year financing, there's a big contractor network, you know, it's like not a problem. And that would obviously be the most important thing to do, because it's the biggest chunk of things that you can do to replace the nuke. So here, if we're thinking in terms of um, um, what we, and the, by contrast, Edison's program and San Diego's program, you can hardly find a rebate. There's no financing, <coughs> and the contractor network is tiny. So this is the result of 30 years of mismanaged programs by the utilities and the CPUC, I have to say. So, uh, you know, I would like as much independence as we can get. 
Um, and I think we, we really are going to need to fight for that. Because I, I, you know, I have the high hopes of the regional energy networks, but as it stands, I have no idea who's, you know, like how effective who's running those. You know, what is, what are they going to do different? I, so um, it's it's kind of murky. Thanks, Barbara. Um, that raises one question, Don. Given this expedited time frame you mentioned, I mean, what what do you need us to do to nice um, given that? Yeah, well, I, I will admit that the recommendation shown here has been um, dramatically revised several times in, in the last um, 10 days. Um, we, we have determined that to submit a, a proposal, a program implementation plan outline, um, there, there's not a need for uh, board approval as there is with the prior plan that we approved for 2012. We're submitting a plan just for our customers. Um, so the recommendation this evening is that the board direct staff to prepare and submit a program implementation plan to the CPUC for our energy program for 2013 and 2014. Um, that will enable us to um, submit a plan by the July 16th deadline. Um, we have been uh, in discussions with the board to try and uh, pin down a date for a special meeting so that the board could review and comment on the plan prior to submittal. That is not a CPUC requirement, um, but if we're able to pull together a special meeting, the dates we've been looking for are Thursday and Friday of next week, and if we're able to achieve a quorum, we will hold a special meeting so that we can um, look at the plan in more detail. Um, however, the recommendation before you to, tonight will enable us to ensure that we can get the plan submitted on schedule based on the outline that's been provided to you. Um, the full proposal, of course, will be made available on Hi, it's Dan Sparrow from Tim Brown. And um, I'd like to offer up to the board, I have four or five energy audits. You can see what they are, and thanks for paying $500 each for them. Thank you. And um, you can have a look at them, have a look at the house, and see what they are. And what really needs to have happen with them is simplification. So the homeowner or an average person in Marin can. Um, get through that process a little easier and simpler and also include a little more electrical stuff because they didn't really do anything for swimming pools, hot tubs and stuff like that which is important in Marin and um, so I, I just want to offer that to you and see what what they do and what they suggest and um, simplification and a speedier process and the time limits they've given and contractors available are, are really difficult to make it, make it all happen. And it needs some um, improvement. I hope, I'm sure Marin will do it, but I'm referring to the California Energy Upgrade System, which uh, you're part of. And um, thank you. Thank you, Sam. So back to the overarching issue. I guess what we need to figure out is the board comfortable based on the parameters that have been outlined to direct staff to go forward and submit this proposal in a timely way. It sounds like if the sentiment is, hey, we want to have a final look, we can probably uh, get a special meeting together. Obviously, we have a chance to re ultimately review the plan. After submitting, I assume, revised if absolutely necessary. Uh, but any comments on that at this point? Well, it seems we certainly don't want to miss the deadline. So that's a good we'll speed with it. And if we can get a special meeting, fine. If we can't, we can. Okay. So, so motion by Tom. Sure. Second by Director Kinsey. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. You have enough direction there, Yes. Okay. Yeah, item 10 and 11 are somewhat related. Um, uh, 10 is uh, discussion and potential action on power purchase agreement with Gen Power LLC. Item 11, power purchase agreement with RE Kansas, ironically, since it's in 
California. Not that serious. Um, and what I've asked staff to also do as part of this discussion is really give a, a bit of an overview of our open season procurement process that gave rise to uh, at least one of these proposals. So, Kirby, are you going to lead us through this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'll lead you through the first agreement, and I think John's going to touch on the second one. But uh, yeah, as as you introduced there, uh, this is this is pretty exciting. This is the the, the first PPA here to uh, be identified as a result of our open season procurement process, which was really uh, quite recently developed earlier this year. And uh, wanted to kind of start here by just providing, as you suggested, um, a bit of background about the open season and, and what we received in terms of responses before we get to talking about the Gen Power LLC agreement that's before you for consideration this evening. Um, so without further ado, just r really the whole impetus for, for introducing this open season process, what was the idea that we have an ongoing need for uh, increased amounts of renewable energy, particularly when we go through expansion periods like we're going through right now and when you're not in municipalities such as we'll be doing uh, very, very soon with the, uh, with the new implementation plan revisions that we have in the city of Richmond coming on board. And so in consideration of that ongoing need, we thought it'd be a good idea to create a formal process, uh, a recurring process, that would uh, allow us to keep in touch with the market and, uh, and really observe more of a dollar cost averaging approach, as you can see in, in the investment community, uh, so that we're biting off small chunks on an ongoing basis um, of our renewable energy need, rather than having to time the market at any, at any one point. Um, so with, with these considerations in mind and the fact that we, we typically receive um, many unsolicited proposals that eat up a lot of staff's time looking through these things on really an ad hoc basis, um, we wanted to try to drive these to, to more of a standardized process, a competitive process uh, that would recruit interest at uh, one or more points during the year and really uh, allow for a, a more expeditious evaluation and a simplified response process uh, for interested project uh, proponents. So what we came up with was the uh, the open season procurement process. And you can see here on the next slide, if you will, uh, some of the requirements that we identified for uh, participation in this process. Uh, just I'll uh, highlight a couple of them here. Uh, one of them is, is the simple fact that all projects proposed uh, in relation to our open season process must be renewable portfolio standard eligible projects. So these must meet the criteria established by the uh, California Energy Commission for eligibility with the state's renewable portfolio standard program. Um, there are different fuel sources that have been identified and, uh, and so long as those, those projects meet those criteria, various size limitations, locational uh, limitations, uh, they will be eligible to participate in this program. And what we were looking at uh, here was really kind of a, a mid-size project range, 1 to 20 megawatts, with annual energy deliveries uh, of no more than 45,000 megawatt hours a year. So again, this is just kind of staying consistent with this idea that we want to be really responsible about our procurement efforts with respect to renewable energy. We know we have um, an increasing need, and we know that timing the market is risky. So this process here uh, really allows us to on an annual basis, go out and take these little bites of that need going forward uh, and do so in such a way where we don't expose ourselves to any particular risk uh, that the market may impose at any particular time. Some of the other requirements here of interest, uh, minimum term length of, of 10 years was required with delivery start dates ranging from January 1st, 2013 out to December 31st, 2016. Didn't want to make that window too big uh, we wanted to just kind of focus in on, on more of a, a near-term uh, project development timeline here. And then really kind of the last one of the key pieces of puzzle here is we were asking for all uh, respondents to propose a single energy price without escalators that would be fixed throughout the contract term. We left it open as to whether or not they'd give other pricing options that might be more favorable for MEA, but as a, as a prerequisite, we required um, all of all the respondents provide just a single price in addition to other uh, 
more creative prices they might send across. And then the other thing that we used as the basis uh, for contract negotiations was MEA's standard renewable energy procurement contract. So uh, that, that provided us uh, with a good starting point. And I think you'll see here as we move into the discussion of this particular contract, um, really by and large that that, uh, that form contract was used in its entirety for that particular uh, deal. So as far as the responses were concerned, we received uh, 43 unique project opportunities proposed by 13 unique respondents. And in total, these responses uh, included over 630 megawatts of renewable capacity located within the state of California. And over 600 of those megawatts were from new facilities, so yet to be developed facilities. And in total, those projects were capable of producing over 1.5 million megawatt hours per year of RPS eligible renewable energy. So a very robust response. Uh, and then the technologies that were represented through this process range from photovoltaic solar, actually the, really the vast majority of the capacity that was proposed under this process uh, was concentrated in the photovoltaic solar generating technology. We did also see uh, proposals come in from wind generators, landfill gas to energy generators, and also biomass generators. And uh, after putting together a pretty detailed evaluative process and working with the ad hoc contracts committee, uh, we were able to narrow down our list to some uh, top candidates. And the, uh, the counterparty, one of the counterparties that we identified through that process was Energy 2001 Inc. And its uh, subsidiary, which is the contracting entity here, Gen Power LLC. And this particular opportunity is, is very interesting for a number of different reasons. Um, one of the reasons in particular is that it's an existing facility that has already attained RPS certification for its uh, project and will be undergoing an expansion before it begins delivering uh, to MEA. This project is located in Lincoln, California, which is in Placer County just east of Sacramento, so generally the same latitude here as Marin, and we consider this to be a regionally located project, about 120 miles, uh, within 120 miles of Marin County. And, uh, and this, this project is co-located uh, at, at a landfill, the Western Regional Sanitary Landfill, which is operated by a, a joint powers agency named the Western Plaster Waste Management Authority, the members of which are the cities of Lincoln, Rockland, and Roseville, as well as Plaster County. And this particular agency provides recycling and waste disposal services uh, to its member communities, as well as the city of Auburn and the okay. town of Loomis. And so the Lincoln Landfill Power Plant, which is the facility that would be providing energy under this particular agreement, uh, it, it does receive its fuel source locally, right on site there, from the landfill, uh, and would be producing about 34,000 megawatt hours a year, uh, which, which is a, a very nice size uh, chunk of our renewable energy need on a going forward basis. And one of the things that's, uh, that's really great about those deliveries is that they'll be delivered on basically a 24 by 7 profile. So this is considered to be a baseload facility. It makes it very easy to plan on that. So we can block that energy in and, uh, and really not worry about it too much, about variations or intermittency, which are concerns with uh, photovoltaic solar or wind sources. So this, is, uh, this, this provides really a, a simplicity of planning going forward. The contract term here is uh, it's a 20 year term with a five year option to extend that term. The, the price is uh, it's a relatively low, in fact, it's a very low energy price that's uh, fixed with no escalators throughout the contract term. Um, let's see, some other items of note here. The deliveries that are contemplated here in the contract would basically supply the entirety of the electricity needs of around 4,000 homes on an annual basis. It's actually a bit more than that, um, but, but that's effectively the conservative estimation. One of the other key points here, and this was one of the, uh, the gives, if you will, on the part of the seller in this case, was their willingness 
to begin deliveries contemporaneously with our expansion to the city of Richmond. So this is something that aligns very well with our needs. We know we're going to have an increased renewable energy requirement as we roll out to those new customers, and they have committed to an initial delivery date, uh, April uh, 2013, which again, parallels our plan expansion time in the city of Richmond. Uh, so that's, that's a, uh, a big benefit there. I don't know if I mentioned this previously, maybe I, I did, but, uh, but this facility is currently selling all of its renewable energy to the city of Roseville's municipal electric utility. Uh, that contract is basically coming to a close, and so they decided to fit this facility into uh, MEA's open season process and they actually wanted to start deliveries sooner than we had a need, uh, but they were able to work out with Roseville an extension of that contract term and the termination of that term um, to basically align with the, the beginning of our need uh, post-expansion. And uh, I think that's, that's, that's really about all I, I have. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And Don, Beth, John, if you have any gaps that you wanted to fill in, um, that's about it. The technology that's used is very similar to the one that's uh, going to be put in place with our contract with uh, G2 Energy. Pretty simple uh, in terms of the uh, mechanics of it all. And again, this is a, this is a very good resource and, uh, and it's currently operating. We'll be undergoing expansion and, and excited about uh, getting this thing online. Yeah, I just had a question for you. Uh, you. Your notes here on the background point out Gen Power LLC is a new entity. I was just wondering if you could explain what was the, the organizational reason to create a new entity for a company that had been around for 10 15 years. Yeah, I, I think there, you know, this is uh, this is pretty typical. It, it, it was actually atypical for the Energy 2001 company to both uh, be kind of the parent and the operating entity as they are now with the, uh, the city of Roseville. It's much more common for these uh, these developers to have kind of an umbrella company with subsidiaries underneath that, um, one for each of their projects. And so I think this was just more than anything to uh, to be consistent with uh, kind of traditional development structures that are out there. And are there any other, are we getting the entirety of their uh, available supply? Yeah, other than just small amounts of on-site use, which is typical with, uh, with these types of facilities, we, we get the balance. Thank you. So the contract's for four point whatever, not two point? Yeah, the, the, the project as it is right now is a 2.4 megawatt facility. Um, they've already basically ordered all the, the generators to expand to the 4.8, and that's going to occur before they begin uh, Commence delivery yeah. Yes, we're buying that whole chunk of four point. Correct. Thank you. Director Kirby, two comments. Sure. I've always wanted to ask this question. Is there a difference between photovoltaic solar and any other kind of solar? Yeah, there's actually a, a number of different kinds. There's a concentrating solar, we'll really use like molten salts to heat up um, heat up liquids to uh, to to spin turbines and, and use you know, and there's actually just pure heat as well. But uh, yeah, there's... So that would not be RPS eligible, so probably that's why you refer to it as well. Well, no, actually, the, the, the others um, are RPS eligible. It's just in this particular open season, all we receive is water. Yeah. The other comment, maybe to the, to the uh, question that, uh, that uh, Dr. Kinsey asked, I would expect that these subsidiaries are formed for various investor purposes and, and, and tax purposes, each one standing there. Okay. So it would make sense that as long as you get the guarantee of the top dog, mm -hmm. uh, I would expect it's more for that purpose, financing and, and capital, raising equity and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, and it, you know, this again, because it's an existing facility, much of you know, there's the substantial portion of the development risk is really gone. Um, and it's, that's, that's kind of one of the nice elements of, of this particular opportunity. And, and just one comment on that is, you know, there's there's kind of two ways of looking at financing in, in the energy industry, and one of the ways, well, I mean, there's there's more than a couple of ways, but one is through corporate financing, where you where you um, get financing for an entire corporate entity, and so that would be something like Coca-Cola or something would do, 
Um, but in the energy industry, it's very common to do what's called project financing, and so you do financing per particular project, and so you lock up um, over a course of a period of time, either the lender um, and the and the, the generator will essentially line up for a long period of time. You know, those site lease and any any inputs that you need. I mean, in this case, you know, do they have the rights to the landfill gas for this period of time? And then it's easy to finance just the project mm -hmm. itself. Um, and so there's, but it is very common as Kirby had mentioned. Uh, Kirby, landfill gas has uh, come under some scrutiny more generally speaking in terms of uh, environmental issues. I wonder if you could react to this specific project sure. in terms of those issues. Yeah. Um, or Don. Yeah, I, I could say a little bit, and I'd also like to, um, to invite the board members that are members of the um, ad hoc contracts committee to comment on um, on that and other things that we discussed um, when we met on this project. But um, yeah, I, I think the one thing that's um, really helpful for folks to know is that there's um, there has been uh, there's one particular paper that has been circulated um, recently in Marin by a committee of the Sierra Club, um, uh, not a Marin group, but um, a committee of, of the Sierra Club. Um, on a more national basis. And they are concerned about practices at a landfill that um, that they that is called the wet cell method, where moisture is injected into the landfill to increase the amount of methane that's generated um, or concentrate the amount uh, that is generated at the beginning term of, of um, uh, organic degradation. Um, that, that process is not allowed in, Cal in the state of California. And um, that process is not used by um, the projects that we have entered into contracts with. Um, there is an allowance for moisture to be recirculated within the landfill, um, and that avoids um, uh, leaching and having to deal with wastewater. But uh, California does um, allow for, and in fact, encourage the recirculation of moisture, but not the introduction of new moisture into the system. So um, this, this project would not be using um, that method. Uh, that uh, seems to be um, a concern for this community at this era. Um, what, one other thing I should add, sorry, is, is that this, um, this type of technology is um, in line with the, a lot of the governing agencies that we must comply with um, and uh, aligns well with what you know, the CPUC is looking to see, the California Energy Commission, and even the EPA. Um, is really encouraging the use of um, landfill uh, waste to energy projects as a way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, and uh, the related pollutants uh, that occur there. And as was noted, it's, a, it's RPS qualifying, it's a base load. Um, uh, Kirby, one thing that we discussed in the, the committee was the 20 year term kind of how that, the pros and cons, how that fits into the overall portfolio. If you could maybe touch on that a little bit. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, one of, one of the nice things about a 20-year term, I think there was, you know, there was some healthy debate within the committee about the, the pros and cons of, of, term, of extended term lengths like this. And I think one of the, one of the key benefits is that, you know, price stability over a term length of, of this period uh, really allows you to take that price stability and translate it into rate stability as well. And that's that's a, a major benefit uh, to our customers. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, from a planning perspective, uh, this simplifies things uh, dramatically from a budgetary perspective and, and it really becomes a, a known entity rather than having escalators or other uh, indices that may affect uh, pricing. Um, I think uh, you know that that's really kind of the, the key piece of the puzzle. We talked a little bit about extended contract terms with other types of technologies like photovoltaic solar or maybe some other more uh, kind of cutting edge type technologies and the fact that there are efficiencies that are always being developed um, and, and there may be uh, potential for risk if you lock in a, a price at a particular point in time and then look back on that 10 years later, there's, a, there's always an opportunity for, for things to change and for that price to be higher than you'd like for it to be. Um, I think one of the, the realities that's worth noting, though, is that at the same time that we're making these decisions, 
load-serving entities throughout the state and nation, for that matter, are making similar decisions. And they're really kind of putting a stake in the ground and saying, at this particular point in time, this is the best available option that we have. And I think that's um, really that's part of the, the prudent decision um, that, that you all have made in the past and, and, and that you all will be considering tonight is, is the idea that at this, given, at this given time, this is really one of the best available options that we've seen. Uh, it's highly competitive in terms of price and the project itself. And if anybody were to have to look back and say, you know, and defend this decision, they realize that this is among the very best options for all entities that are out there. And so I think there's there's some comfort that can be taken in that as well. What happens if they don't meet the guaranteed commercial operation day? Are they able to do that? Good question there. Yeah, there are uh, damages that will uh, flow through to the agency if they don't meet these dates. Uh, that is actually, these are identified on the cover sheet to the transaction. You can see here there's a, an amount that exceeds $200,000. Uh, and if they fail to meet those uh, delivery obligations, then, uh, then those, those amounts will flow through to MEA and can be used to offset costs associated with replacing uh, that renewable energy if those deliveries are met. Yeah, and you'll see the mechanics to that in Exhibit B. Um, and this is part of our standard form. The figures are part of our standard form that's been developed. Um, so it's, it's an MEA standard term. Kirby, um, the process of this, this offering now has generated 43 different proposals. Uh, which seems like almost an embarrassment of riches. Our contract committee then ranks them, is that correct, according to several criteria? Correct. Right. Are, are all 43 suitable for us if we so choose, chose to do that, or just the top four or five or something like that? Yeah, it, it would just be the, the top. So the other ones we pretty much reject. Yeah, correct. And we, and we are, are very diligent about communicating with those counterparties. Kind of that we, we choose to excuse, for lack of a better term, from the, from the process. And uh, oftentimes, those counterparties uh, will follow up with us and ask questions about what they can do to improve their proposal or... And resubmit or something. Well, not, yeah. it, maybe Some not resubmit point. at that particular point in time, but resubmit at a point in time in the future. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, you know, price and, and project location, I mean, those are kind of key determinants of how these facilities rank out, and uh, and as you typically see with any solicitation effort like this, there's usually a pretty wide uh, variation in pricing, but that pricing tends to, you know, the, the best of the best really converge in a pretty narrow band, and so that's what we found in this case. And But yes, we do, we go through with the uh, committee, um, discuss those rankings in detail, as well as, uh, you know, kind of qualitative elements that were included in each one of the responses to derive a, uh, really kind of a short list or top prospect ranking, and those were the, the folks that we moved forward in discussions with. And then this was, quite, quite frankly, one of the best of the best, yeah. so we're pretty excited about this. Director, yeah. is there any type of, because it's an LLC entity, is there any type of personal guarantee or from other entities or across something to further secure it if there's a, a failure? Yeah, so the way that we've that we've structured this instead of having a parental guarantee is we structure it just that it's a letter of credit or cash that has to be posted to mm -hmm. our benefit. Um, and then that's used as the collateral, you know, in the event of failure. How much is the LLC in this instance? Oh, the, the LC in this is going to be two hundred and sixteen thousand. Oh, yeah. Well, and actually, so, yeah. They actually, I mean, I said that was a liquidated damages, but that's actually posted as an LLC. That's posted. Okay, great, thanks. Yep. Director Kirk. Yes, I had a couple of questions. Um, the first one has to do with the fact that the nature of this, con or the nature of the energy um, generation is from a landfill. Here in Marin, there's lots of talk about zero waste. Should this area that, that currently is dumping into this landfill and go to zero waste, I'm assuming um, that's going to very much interfere with the ability of the landfill to create gas. So uh, have you thought about that and what are the provisions uh, should that happen within the 20 year term of the contract? Yeah, basically the, the studies that have been done at this particular point indicate that the current size of the landfill, um, that would support the 4.8 megawatts that we've contracted for for the duration of the term. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if anything above and beyond that 
would create the opportunity for uh, Energy 2001 or another entity to come in and, and add uh, generation to that. But uh, so, so if there were to be some sort of zero waste or, or you know, um, discussion of that nature that would affect this particular opportunity, it shouldn't in any way influence our ability to, to, to receive deliveries from this facility. Right. May I ask another question? Of course. And forgive me, I'm just an alternate. Um, why is there no contract price listed in the contract or on the cover sheet? Definitely a wreck. <laughs> that's, that's a great right question, Diane. Yeah, so why don't you guys? My knowledge is a matter of fact. That's a great question. So why don't you guys? When we're negotiating contracts uh, for power supply, um, it puts both parties at a disadvantage if the price is disclosed before the contract has been executed. Um, the price, um, after execution, the price is shown, it's all made public, um, even though the, the counterparties don't always like that either. Um, but at least during the negotiation process, um, it is, it's helpful to us as far as our negotiation with other counterparties for folks not to be aware of what they're up against. Um, and it's also helpful to um, the counterparty that we're negotiating with that other folks in the world don't see, you know, what is their price with this particular um, they're working with. So um, the way that we address the, the issue is we we have, um, we can discuss these, of course our, our staff and consultant team um, looks at that very closely and uses the proposed prices as part of our evaluative process for any proposals that come in. We also... And then the contracts committee is aware of the prices. Yeah, we also bring it to the contracts committee and um, so that was discussed as recently as Monday um, with the prices included. Um, in that committee, which is um, and not in a public setting, so it's, uh, it's easier to have that type of discussion without the, um, the, the issues that come up. Okay, uh, follow up question. Yeah. Um, how many board members are on that committee, number one? And number two, um, after the contracts are approved and, and adopted, um, do you then disclose what the um, offer prices were Sorry. on all of the other contracts that were evaluated Sorry. as well? The other contracts that were evaluated um, are not disclosed. They were submitted to us on a confidential basis um, and we, we agreed not to um, share those publicly. If we made a practice of sharing all of our proposals, then the number of proposals we get would diminish drastically in future solicitations. Um, so, but uh, as far as the contract that is approved, um, as soon as the contract is executed and signed by both parties, um, it's then available publicly. Um, the number of members on our con ad hoc contracts committee is four. Thank you. Yeah, that question comes up all the time, okay. and it's a great question. Um, so hopefully that addresses that issue. Um, any further discussion at this point of item 10? Or members, <laughs> members of the public. I mean, Don, what do you think? Should we launch into item 11 before voting on the vote? Should we take this one separately? Yeah. 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 yeah, maybe we should wrap this one up. Okay. All right, bringing it back to the board on item 10. <laughs> proposed PPA with Gen Power LLC. Do I have a motion for approval? Move to approve uh, power purchase agreement with Gen Power LLC for additional renewable energy supply. Second. Motion and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That matter carries. Okay, turning to item 11, which is a PPA with RE Kansas LLC, located in California. That is correct, in uh, Lemoore, California, in, in Kings County. <laughs> Uh, so this is a, a proposed PPA for um, a new solar PV facility located in Central Valley. And uh, when we were putting the packet together, we were anticipating that we'd be presenting this PPA for approval. Uh, we're not quite there. Actually, there's still a, a couple of loose ends um, that we're, we're wrapping up with the developer. Um, so I do want to take this opportunity to brief uh, provide a briefing on this project. 
uh, but we um, will not be requesting approval of EPA. This time we'll bring this back to the future meeting. So this particular opportunity, uh, we were approached by the developer, which is a San Francisco-based company called Current Energy. And uh, they are the, the global development arm for Sharp Corporation. Sharp is a, is a very uh, uh, large manufacturer of photovoltaic systems, and the current is the development arm. Um, they, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a project that uh, is, is being developed and is, uh, will be under contract to one of the large investor-owned utilities uh, beginning in 2018. Um, that's when the utility told the developer that's when they want the power no sooner. Uh, the developer uh, indicated that they could achieve an uh, accelerated construction date for the project and be in line on the guarantee of January 2016 um, and asked if NBA would be interested in, in taking the power for that two year period. In fact. Um, so we, uh, we said we were interested that particular time frame lines up quite well with, uh, with our resource needs, uh, particularly, particularly with the existing Shell Agreement, which will expire in uh, early 2015. Uh, some of the renewable deliveries for that agreement would have to be replaced. Um, so we said we were interested, and, uh, but it would have to be at the right price. Um, and we were able to negotiate a, uh, a discounted price really a, a, a very attractive price for the short-term power purchase. So um, the particulars of the developer here, as I mentioned, it's uh, their current energy headquartered in San Francisco. Uh, they've got offices throughout North America, about 100 uh, folks on staff at the company. And they're a, a well-regarded solar developer They've, uh, they've got about uh, two and a half to 2,500 megawatts of projects in, in their development pipeline, um, 500 megawatts of the contract, and 130 megawatts of, of that amount is within California. Um, in terms of a project you may be familiar with, if you are familiar with the, the San Francisco's um, Sunset Reservoir solar project, this is the company that developed that. It's a five megawatt project. They're selling the city of San Francisco. And in regards to the project itself, as I mentioned, it's a, a new PV project, 20 megawatts in size. Uh, the, uh, the technology itself is a proven technology. It's a ground mount, uh, single axis tracking system located in the more. Uh, the, uh, it's a, fairly high capacity factor for this type of technology, 28%, so that'll uh, expect it to produce 49,000 megawatt hours annually. Um, and it's, it's you know, photovoltaics, so it'll be a peaking type of production. This type of technology delivers energy to NBA when it's most valuable during the, the peak hours. The way that the, uh, the draft agreement has been structured is that uh, we would have a, a guarantee online date of January 1, 2016. So the project would come on no later than that date. If, if it slips, there would be damages approval to the end. Um, but the project could come online earlier. So this will be anywhere from a, a, a two-year nominal agreement to up as much as a three-year agreement if the project were to come online at the earliest date, which would be January 1, 2015. Go to the next slide. So you know, we, with this particular deal, we again we started with NBA standard contract for renewable power. Uh, so I won't go through the standard terms, but I'll just highlight the um, well, the changes that we've, we've negotiated so far. Uh, the first change to note, and I've included the, the section number and attached PPA. Uh, the first sort of deviation from our standard form is the delivery point, um, and uh, in this particular case. MEA would schedule the resource and take delivery at the project site. Um, what, uh, what, what we have done, and we've done this with other agreements as well, um, but uh, our preference would be to, to have the, um, the generation owner schedule the resource and deliver to us at the MP15 MP trading hub. Uh, but this is, a, this is something that we're generally pretty flexible on. The, uh, 
This agreement includes this concept of an earliest COD, which actually works in uh, NEA's favor in that, again, we have the guaranteed online date of January 2016. Uh, if the project is built sooner than that, we would agree to take delivery, but we've specified a date uh, that you know, before, if, it, if it's sooner than that specified date, the earliest COD, we have no obligation to buy the power. So we've set that date to be July of uh, 2015. And if the project comes in, the project could start delivering as early as January 2015. If that's the case, we would actually get an additional discount on the energy. Um, so we've got this new sort of concept in here, earliest COD, and that uh, provides a little bit of additional planning certainty to, to NDA associated with the agreement. And, and just for clarification, COD is commercial operations. Thank you. So, we like to use lots of acronyms. <laughs> Um, another provision that's not in our standard, although we do have it in another agreement, is uh, it requires revenue maintenance provision. And this simply sets forth uh, certain benchmarks uh, that NDA will, will um, have gross revenues in excess of certain specified amounts, which are reflective of NDA's plan of growth and, and the number of customers. Since we're, as of last month, uh, you know, the NDA was serving about 14,000 customers and maybe a $20 million a year operation. Uh, now, as we go through the month of July, in the, in the phase two expansion, the NDA is going to have something around 100,000 customers and be about 100 million a year operation. So, um, this particular provision just sets out these benchmarks that the NDA must meet, and they're, they've been set below, uh, well below our projections, so we don't anticipate any difficulty in meeting these. Benchmarks. And then the, the final provision um, that's different here from our standard is this, there's a little bit of um, a refinement to the provision for resource adequacy. So this is you know, a, a facility like this produces energy, it, it uh, provides capacity, which is also valuable to us um, because we have an obligation to uh, contract for capacity for liability reasons. And of course, it also provides the renewable energy attribute. So there's really three, I think, three products that are being purchased here. Um, this resource adequacy provision simply says that we'll agree to pay for the resource adequacy um, to the extent it qualifies uh, to, to meet our, our, our um, capacity obligation with, with the state. So um, again, uh, we'll be bringing this agreement back at a future date for approval. Um, we're uh, actually quite excited about this project. Uh, it's, it, it fits our, our needs for a number of reasons. Uh, but we're not there yet. Okay, great. Any questions at this point for Director, Director Crowley? Can you clarify for me the, the statement, your last sentence on page one, when you say the timing of deliveries will help replace the plant reduction of renewable energy from CN? Wouldn't any contract we let do that? Wouldn't sure. any of them allow us to reduce our scene obligation? Any contract with this, with this delivery date, yes. So I'm just saying here the timing of the delivery here is, uh, fits well with our, our resources. Okay. And that's always been our goal since the beginning. I mean, since we got a great deal of criticism for contract with the scene. Right, absolutely. So, that out there. so you know. Each time uh, we bring another mobile power purchase agreement for you, it's, it's another step in that direction. Great question. Any further uh, discussion or comments on this? Just one question. Yes. Uh, these two are the first two of the uh, <coughs> agreements that you bring before, is that right? Mm -hmm. Out of the 43 that you've reviewed? Yes, from the open season for process. This. There right. have been the other power purchase agreements that we brought um, to the board um, for solar, um, landfill gas to energy. We executed quite a few over the last year and a half. Um, but these, um, the Gen Power Agreement is the first one coming out of our open season process, which launched this year. Right. And so, um, do you uh, have a plan to do this open season process on an annual basis? Is that what it is? Yes. Um, so you close it and clear the deck on the ones. You know, will these be the only two that you select out of this first offering, this first season? Yeah, we're actually in negotiations with uh, another counterparty, 
and um, may have an agreement coming out of that, those discussions as well uh, in the next month or two. Um, and just for clarification, this, this solar project was not a direct result of the open season process. Um, this counterparty did apply under our open season, um, but this, this project is slightly different than, than uh, what was required in the open season parameters. But we do, it looks like we may have two agreements coming out of the open season process. Thank you. And as Don is, is suggesting, there still is room to do bilateral negotiations outside of that process as well. Okay, members of the public on this side. All right, any sense of your timing on bringing it back to us? Um, I think it's likely that this will come back at our next regular board meeting. If there's a need to do it sooner, we need to call a special meeting due to our hiatus in August. But um, I, I believe we'll, that we'll have this wrapped up by September. Okay, great, thanks. Item 12, appointment of board members to technical. So um, we, have, we have an open seat on our technical committee, and we've been uh, looking to fill that seat now for a couple of months, um, and we're uh, and happy to report that uh, Dr. Connolly has uh, expressed a willingness to sit on that committee. Who's on right now? He's afraid you're going to say that. <laughs> yeah, who's on that right now? Um, currently, uh, Director Green. Uh, Director Sears, um, uh, Director Bragman, and um, then this will be the fifth seat. Oh, and Director Mullen, excuse me. The chair. Yeah, chair. <laughs> I forgot the <laughs> <name>, sorry. <laughs> Is that former it sounds like sit Director Riff kind of expressed his interest. <laughs> I thought I attended a couple of those meetings already, so I guess. Okay, I'm trying to talk you into that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, we'll follow up with you on that for sure. Okay, do we need any yeah. action on that? Uh, if we want to appoint someone to the reading seat, then yes. Okay, so I have agreed to do that. Move the chair now. I'll Does that feel for lack of a second? I think I heard one. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, item 13, communications. Great, thank you so much. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to point out was that uh, uh, we distributed this document that had our up updated uh, community meetings and events wasn't included in your board packet, but it's here for review. And uh, the one thing I wanted to know about uh, recent meetings was that the Town of Puerto Madera Council voted on Tuesday this week to enroll their municipal accounts with our light green 50% renewable energy. So that's great news. Thanks to everyone who participated in that meeting. And we're excited to uh, begin providing service for those municipal accounts. Um, what yeah, I wanted to compliment Director first on um, uh, speaking out for the program at her meeting. I was there and appreciate it. Uh, one of the things that was included in your packet, actually the only thing that was included in your packet this month for the communications update is the draft opt-out notice. This is for the fourth of the five notices that we're sending out. Um, and we've come up with a schedule for the phase 2B customers. Approximately half of the customers who were eligible for enrollment this month will be enrolled by July 17th. And so uh, we'll be breaking out the the mailing and the distribution of this fourth opt-out notices, fourth opt-out notice into uh, two batches based on enrollment schedule. So uh, the group of customers who are enrolled by July 17th will get this opt-out notice on July 23rd. And uh, the second group will be enrolled later in July and will get their first opt-out notice on August 6th. And then we've also come up with the schedule for the fifth notice that would actually have the same text, so it would, it would mirror this opt-out notice. And those uh, would go out on 
uh, August, let's see, the second, the second notice would go out on August 20th and September 3rd. So I was wondering if anyone had uh, any feedback on the opt-out notice that was attached for text changes or anything along those lines. If not, uh, if you wanted to provide any feedback, I need to get it by tomorrow, as these will be going to the printers. And this is pretty much what we already gave you feedback. It's, it's a little bit different, uh, just because I mean, the language is slightly revised to reflect that the customer has, in fact, already been, been enrolled. Okay. Um, and so the terms and conditions are slightly different in the enrollment and opt-out section, and, and just a little bit on the, uh, let's see, the first paragraph on the left-hand side of the mailer. Hey, Jamie, can you tell us, is it, re is it required after people have already been enrolled? I know we've always had plans for five. Is it statutory or what's the basis? At this point, we do have a requirement for sending out two opt-out notices within the first 60 days of service. So again, we are going above and beyond uh, by sending out five notices. And we did that by sending three instead of two as required uh, before enrollment. But the two notices after enrollment, is that in the legislation? Is that where that yes. card comes from? Thank you. Leslie, you had a comment? We had um, had some concerns about um, seniors understanding, senior and disabled um, and low income understanding the differences or not between PG&E's programs and MEAs. And that's not mentioned here and that has been a, a, a source of concern for a lot of um, potential customers. Can you be more specific? No, just, no, just you know, what seniors and disabled have been making the most of the phone calls that we've been getting in our offices um, at the county with regard, with, with, with concern and, and confusion as to whether the programs that they enjoy as PG&E customers, senior disabled, low income, the, the care programs, um, and they want to know, they want that guarantee that they will have that if they stay with MEA and if they opt out of MEA and stay with pg &E, that's often the reason why um, people mention they're just confused and they're afraid. So if we address that up front and reassure people that they are not losing those benefits, that might be um, a, a help. We could address that potentially in the rate section of the terms and conditions of service to clarify that all customers will still receive their care discount and medical baseline allowance discount through pg &E. You might want to put that in bolder, bigger. Highlighted. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't bury that in the in the small print, so to speak, even though it's not that small. But that's just a suggestion. But be sure to add it as out. Okay, I can add that text in. Okay, great. Thanks for that feedback. Thank you. All right, if there are no other comments about on the opt-out notice, I'll move in on to my next subject, which is about a brochure that we are working on now. Um, we are creating a four-page brochure insert that will be circulated in uh, Marin newspapers. Um, it's going to be circulated in the Marin IJ, the Marin Scopes, the Pacific Sun, and the uh, Marin and Richmond edition of the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, so it will actually be an insert in the newspapers and the total distribution in Marin will be at about 100,000. So we are planning on bringing the draft text to the executive committee this month and uh, we plan to have that be distributed in mid-August, which will be really good timing because that's about when customers will start receiving their first bill, either in you know, mid to late August or early September, to, depending on their enrollment. So I think this will be a really great way to get direct information uh, to our potential customers and everyone in Marin and also to start reaching out to people in Richmond about what Marin Clean Energy is. Any questions about that? Okay, the last thing that I have to talk about is rates. And I'm going to take over the wheel on the computer for your DS, but uh, what I wanted to let you all know was that on July 1st, PG&E implemented their final rates 
And so those are now effective. And as a result, we've updated the information on our website uh, for the average cost comparisons for residential and commercial customers. It's changed just a little bit so that the average residential customer can expect to pay about $3.85 more per month. Um, and what we've also been able to do is launch our rate calculator, and we did that today. So I'm going to mm -hmm. take your seat for just a second, your niece. And uh, this is the website that's up and live currently, and this is the, the rates calculator for um, the, the average residential customer who's just on the basic rate, which means there isn't any time of use. And we've incorporated the suggestions that your board provided at the last meeting. And uh, you can see here what you do is just simply enter your usage into this section. So I'll enter 500 kilowatt hours. There's a link here uh, that shows you where on your bill you can find your usage. And when you click on that, it shows up this sample bill and highlights where on your pg e bill you can find that usage. So you enter your usage here in the calculator, you click next, and it would take you to the results page, which basically breaks down the cost comparison. Uh, it shows for, initially, for the light green product, and it shows the cost of electric generation uh, for marine clean energy, and you can see here for this customer, uh, the generation actually results in a cost savings of a little under a dollar. Uh, the next thing it addresses are the pg &E exit fees imposed on marine clean energy customers and then the total cost difference for that customer to switch to light green for that month. If you scroll down, it shows the same information but for deep green, 100% renewable, in case the customer is interested in learning that information. The calculator also shows associated greenhouse gas emissions reductions uh, for switching to light green or deep green, and then we provide more detailed information about generation rates, what that is, the exit fees from pg e are also included here with the description. And so I, I wanted to let you all see that. Um, I'll send a link for this in an email tomorrow and I'd encourage that you share it with your constituents. Does anyone have any questions or comments will, about that? Will that be included in this flyer you're talking about that's going out in newspapers? Or is that printed already? It's not printed already. I could uh, certainly put a link to it, actually. Right now, we have a link on, yeah. we have the URL listed as marinecleanenergy.com slash rates, which brings you to the home page. And there's a, a link to it, not the home page, the, the basic rates page. And there's a link to that calculator there. But I could change it so it's just a link to the calculator. So, yeah, so that's on the home page. You've got to make it really <laughs> easy. People on the home page, it says calculator, and it either is there or you click right to it. Right. right. So the URL is actually bringing you to the rates page with this link right here. Um, and I just put this up tonight, but tomorrow I'm going to make this more obvious with some uh, design, enhanced design. Can you bring us to the home page? Yes. The, the internet might be a little bit slow. While she's doing that, I'll, I'll make a comment. I think one of the things that we, we want to do with our publicity material and marketing material is um, get people to um, a, a, the bigger story of, of marine clean energy. Um, I think if we drive them only to the rates calculator page, they might miss out on some of the other um, things that are really important about what we have to offer in the community. So. Um, I think that balancing that, yeah, those two that. items is, is, um, you know, is, a, is a challenge, but um, something to think about. No, I, I hear that, Don. There's competing, well, you want to, of course, tell the story, and we're, we're here trying to make sure we keep customers and consent to the product, but I, I think we still want to make it as transparent as possible and make it easy for people that are, are there that are going to want to try to figure out the rate, that they don't have to try too hard once they get through the website to be able to get to a calculator, if that's what they choose to do. Yeah, if that's what they're interested in. You know, this, you know, it needs to be relatively easy for people to do that. I think that's a and good And I'm point. a dinosaur, okay? All I can do is point and click, so I have to be able to point. 
So luckily before this meeting started, I got all of the rate calculator info already up here and mm -hmm. um, the internet is, is not letting me go back to the home page. So I can't review that, but I would be happy to review it with you offline. And um, we did update the menu so that the rates was a main menu item um, before it was embedded only in your account to make it simpler. Um, I'm just giving the idea. I'm not a web designer. You know, I'll right. that. You guys will figure out how to do this a comment. The second one is, is um, on the calculator, us lawyers are always concerned about disclaimers. And just to make sure that yes. you know, there's some uh, very pithy bet language in there or something like that that we'll talk about mm -hmm. how this is what your anticipated rate if you're an average customer, but there's no guarantees and all that sort of stuff. This will be exactly what it is. Great. We, we do have some language at the top for that. Um, that's right here in orange, orangish red that you can see, um, and it does say that it's you know an estimate of total cost based on our on PG and and MCE rates, and that actual cost may vary. There's also a link to let's see on the results page. There's also a link to the source document that basically um, describes how we came up with the calculations. And the fees that were. Um, That's good. I just care that the, that the lawyers have thought about a, a disclaimer of some sort. Well, we mentioned that last There's plenty of lawyers. Think. Yeah. I think that can also be a So, did you meet the test? Is going to be compliant on the yeah. break. Yeah. 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 On that break, yeah. We can so move on to life. That, we just send it over. I know we I see rates of loans there. Make cost savings? Yeah, so like that first line. Okay. It's an 80 and it's a savings. All right, guys. Why don't we turn back to the chair? Yeah. Just in the process. Yeah. 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 Yeah calculates care rates? No, and the reason for that is that the care discount is actually applied on the transmission and distribution side of the bill, and it does not affect your generation rate. Um, on our rates page, we do have information about that, um, but basically the calculator wouldn't change uh, because of the, the rates. So, so here they, we talk about the discount rates. Okay. You think that needs to be spelled? Maybe, more. maybe. Care customer it's should. On the calculator? Yeah. Yeah. As it should direct patient. them so they understand. Apropos of what we just said on the non opt out notice, could apply to mm -hmm. the uh, language there as well. Director first. Um, I tend to like spreadsheets. So personally, I would like to see on the rate calculator something more akin to what you have on the rates page that shows for light green, deep green, as well as PG&E, what the usage is, um, what the transmission is, what the PCIA is, and total, and then you can calculate the difference. This to me, it, it just it gives an overview, but it doesn't explain how the bill, it, it doesn't illustrate how it's calculated, it just kind of throws you a number. And this is an opportunity to kind of educate people about how their bill is calculated, much like like I said on the on the first rate page. Remember going back to that real quick. Uh, down a little bit, right there, so that then you can see the total and you can see exactly where the differences are. I mean, one the theory behind it, frankly, was that. Folks like kind of the bottom line number uh, that you want to punch in your usage and find out what your rate's going to be. Okay, well, I'll defer to the rest of the board, but personally, I think it's really interesting to see that the transmission doesn't change. You know, and, and that really kind of illustrates for people, you know, where the money's going and the PGE is, you know, still getting there. Portion and and you know marine clean energy doesn't have any effect on that portion of the bill. Just it also highlighted the magnitude of the bill on the side on, on, yeah. the, on the other side. Right. Right. This is where the, where so how, it sounds like we can do both. It's kind of like that. 
I think that um, adding language describing how the, the bill is calculated and the fact that we're only replacing the generation portion of the transmission and distribution stays the same no matter what is a good idea. Part of the reason we didn't want to include the transmission and distribution and all the other fees from PG&E is because those change a lot and that basically puts us at more risk of having the calculator be incorrect. You know, instead of just having to follow PG&E's generation rates, that means we have to keep track of their transmission and distribution and all of their other rates as well. Um, so, you know, that was really the logic behind that. But I think that adding the text and the description could serve the same purpose, I think, is what you're looking for. That might do. I guess, <laughs> I guess that, Diane, my, my thought is, is that the vast majority of folks, most, most folks aren't even going to do anything. They're just going to be in and they're out to the end. Then the next level of person might be what I'll call my level. They just want to click on the one and them. And then the next level is your level who actually wants to understand it. Okay. And then, and so, because, and I think there's less of you than there is of me. Okay. And so, um, if you want to understand it, you get to pick up the phone and call these folks or the, the center, and they could probably walk you through a fair amount of calculations or give you some more of the detail. But if we put too much detail on this website, then concerned for the reasons of what Jamie just said about disclaimer, risk, liability, that sort of thing. And, and I don't think there's a lot of people like you that actually want to understand everything. But that's just my thought. I think the verbiage makes sense. I, I share that concern about once we start plugging in pg &E, transmission and distribution numbers that frequently change. We do actually already have text on the calculator that describes, you know, that we're replacing um, PG&E's electric generation service and those costs and that the other um, fees from PG&E will remain the same and that they'll continue to provide those services and uh, we also have a source document that basically gets into more detail about all the assumptions and methods I think can be another place for, for people who are more interested in, in, the, um, in the details of it all. Um, is there some wisdom, perhaps, in explaining the PCIA and the exit fees and that those at some point will sunset? Yeah, and we actually do describe that, I believe, in our description right here of the fees. I have my glasses on, but I still can't read all of that. <laughs> yeah, but you know what, Jamie, what you might do to that end is when you scroll up, you might footnote that PCIA because one of my questions was um, does that PCIA fee reflect the reduction that the PC, PUC passed so is that the, that's the reduced PCIA yeah it's the 2012 it's vintage the current vintage okay so it is the current and then how long um, is it scheduled to last um, it, is that changes I it's, guess. yeah it depends on the vintage year Jamie, could you go back down to the verbiage? Mm -hmm. Right there. Up, up. Oops. Right here. The generation rates or the PCIA verbiage? Right here. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, any other comments or questions? Yes, so I'm going to assume that, that there was no interest in further explaining because to me that PCIA charge is what jacks up the cost. That's what makes up the differential. Mm -hmm. And so isn't there a way to even footnote it there to soften the impact by letting people know that over time that goes away? Yes. Even and though you can't be specific. But I think my problem, Jamie, is it gets lost yeah. It gets lost below, but you lose the impact of that message if it's just stuck in the fine print below. Just, just a thought. Because if all they care about is the bottom line, they're going to want to know that that exit fee goes away over time, and maybe that will incent them to stick around. And I think that you know the policy direction here is, is tricky because we have to strike a balance between being really clear and transparent um, and providing accurate 
detailed information. And it's very difficult, or it's not possible to do both very well. So you know, we have to strike a balance. I think that um, the document that we had on the website prior to this calculator being available was more of a spreadsheet format where we showed T&D charges, estimated T&D charges. We gave a total estimated bill amount that broke down those charges. And that um, document, I believe, is still available. So if folks want to look at that, they can. Um, I, but the, the question is, you know, how much detail do we want to get into? One, one example is if, if we have someone that has a 2009 vintage on their PCIA, their, their total cost difference is going to be less. You know, they're going to end up with a, um, a, a, less, a, a lower exit fee. A lower one size doesn't fit all this. Well, why, why can't you do this? I mean, aren't all websites the basic for is, is up there and someone wants more information they click on a hyperlink or something like yeah. that that takes them to a definition section so you can you can delve into as much information as you want and other pages make it simple i mean that's that's what most websites are like you get your basic and if you want more information it's, it's available to you but just not on that page it, but it's clear where you can click it by a hyperlink yeah, this exercise at the bottom was really a, a response to the public mm -hmm. demand for a, a simple rate calculator. How much more am I going to be paying? But I like the idea of providing the, the other information for people who want it. Um, right now we have the chart. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're hearing is maybe supplement that with some verbiage. <clears throat> perhaps directly addressing the PCIA in more detail without going too far in terms of out of a zone where we can speak accurately. So it's not an accurate Sorry. statement to say that the PCIA goes down over time because of that vintaging situation that you can't, you can't say that as a blanket statement. It does, you know, it does diminish over time. Right. Uh, I think that's a fair statement, but but you know it's also based on the calculation that's done each year. Yeah, so so I want to offer some hope. Right. That's all. Yeah. yeah, and so so generally over time, you know that exit fee will diminish because right. what it relates to is above market cost of power procured on behalf of those right. you know, and the prior they're to in. departure of those customers, and so um, you know the the reference for what the market price is and how much things are above or below market changes every year. Um, but overall, I mean, the, the end result is that should reach zero at some point. Do we have an idea of when that zero happens? I mean, ballpark. Ten years, five years, thirty years. Could be between ten and fifteen years. For example, it, it depends on the, the year that um, when they depart. Director first. Then might I make a, a suggestion? Everywhere where it says PGE PCIA fee or PGE exit fee on that rate calculator, you put right underneath it in small lettering in parentheses, limited time fee or something like that, just to really make it clear and then make them look for more information down below. Sean, would that give them hope? Thank you. I'm just looking for a little compromise. I don't think you want to give them too much hope, though. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I heard it. 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 I think we're just asking for the naysayers to come out and say, you are you know, you, we're just asking for trouble. I know we talk about this all the time at our council meetings. We send out communications to our community. We're responsible as council peoples to explain these extra fees and, and what they are. And so I think it falls upon us. I think what you've done is great. I think simpler is better. The more complicated you start adding things in there, the more you confuse people. And. Um, so, I think we let it speak for itself. I absolutely agree. And we provide additional. Is there PCIA verbiage on the website? Right now? Yes, there is. There's well, there's PCIA verbiage here, and it's on our FAQ and our rates page. Okay. I mean, take another look at it. I mean, I think that 
probably covers it. I agree with that risk of trying to characterize it, especially if it's 10 to 15 years. Um, albeit, our understanding is it will go down over time. We don't want to get ahead of ourselves in characterizing that. Uh, Stan, I think you had a comment. Yeah, um, to give you an idea of the confusion causing to some of the people are asking me uh, who are receiving opt-out notices and wondering what their rates are, I'm at Intersolar and the top electrician for Intersolar where there's 3,000 solar companies coming together this weekend um, and he's asking me about marine clean energy and what you're doing because he lives in Marin. And he was all confused about the opt-out notices and the rates and I was trying to explain to him that calling it what it is, uh, PCIM, PG&E's Corrupt Profit Insurance um, Guarantee. Is something like that? Isn't that? It doesn't sound like PCIA. <laughs> but that's basically what it is. They're just uh, getting a guarantee that they have more profit for their CEO. Is that right? A super PAC could get away with that, but I don't think anybody I can get away with that. <laughs> yeah, let's uh, get back on track. This is actually a really good discussion. I mean, any kind of final comments on this? I think overall, great job. Let's make it quick. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I, I didn't know where the conversation ended up. Are we going to say this is going, you know, expected to go down over time? I think some kind of language that this is not a permanent fee necessarily should be in there. I mean, <coughs> well, it sounds like that's in our FAQ or something, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it's all, it, is it in this rate calculator? Because this, this is where it needs to be. It's actually not. We're going to be looking. I mean, but, that's where I'd like to see it, is somewhere in that, in the D, you know, PG. I think fees. we're getting pushback on that idea from the board, though, that we want to take a very conservative approach and just state what the PCI is, and we can, we can describe what it is, but uh, we're not prepared to... But I thought it does go down over time because it has to do well, with Well, it sounds projects. like there's, it depends on the vintage year, it depends on a lot of things that once you start getting into, um, you know, gets into a very complicated discussion. What about a wobbler simple statement may go down over time? Something like that. Now, so there's no time frame, there's no, you know, so something like that in that box may go may reduce over a period of time something like that now now we've, now it's satisfied everyone's needs yes. no, i don't think so i think you start to put vague words in it it opens it up for interpretation and then you get yourself into trouble i mean if if you put down any statement like it may it may go down or it will go down then people are going to ask the next logical question is by how much and when and when you know, so, and those are two questions that we can't answer, so why put ourselves in the position? I mean, it's just, it looks like a 10 or 15 years to me is not limited. That sounds pretty permanent for a very long time <laughs> for most people. It's a whole dog's life. And right look, there. we're going to, we're going to, we're going to keep fighting to make sure it continues to go down. It's, it's, it's a PUC uh, calculation, but I, you know, I it's fully agree that let's not characterize it at this point. It sounds like that's the overall consensus of the board. Okay, so we're going to move on from that issue. Um, anything else on communication, Sam? No, that's it. Thank yeah, you Yeah, so take a look at those couple things. Just, you know, is there kind of robust factual verbiage on a couple of those key items? But overall, very cool that we have the rate right calculator. Okay. I think that'll be very good. Can I add one comment? Maybe just one comment I wanted to add is that this, this uh, calculator is not for um, an average residential customer, but um, we are, uh, Simon specifically and Jamie are working on uh, developing the next iterations that will include commercial and um, some other okay. classes, that those, those will be up soon. And um, we're open to any feedback you all have as we as we launch these. We can, it's kind of an iterative process so we can make adjustments if needed. Yeah, by the way, Simon, you're the mastermind. 
I don't make it. Okay. <laughs> Just to briefly say something that Pat on the onset, the commercial calculator will be more illustrative and has a lot more details that need to be hashed out by the user. So something like this is designed to be super straightforward, bottom line, you look at it, get your answer. But for the customers with more complex rate classes, they'll get the full explanation in their rate calculator. Including time of year, yeah. all that sort of thing. like rates. Okay, great. Right. Don, what, what is the average monthly uh, rate? Um, for residential? Residential, yeah. Um, five in Marin County, the average usage is about 540 kilowatt hours per month. Dollar, dollar. So on average, the, the average rate? You mean the average well, the rate? The average, the average because we, we're talking here about $3.85 a month. Uh, the overall bill. Compared to what? And what percentage? Yeah. The average bill is about $100, a little over $100 a month. So it's about 4%. Uh -huh. Okay. I, I have that information actually. Yeah. 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 Ross's average is much higher. It's, it's about 13 something. Yeah. 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 It's about, for an average uh, customer, it's around $90 a month for mm -hmm. your entire electric bill. We're and, about and it's about th a little over $3 more per month. So. Yeah. Simon, thank you. That was good work. Very good work. Yeah. The IJ will be happy. They called this morning. Okay, item 14, regulatory update. Great, I'm ready. This is always the <laughs> attraction of the show. This is what we come to. Thanks, Jamie. For those of you who are new and joining us, this is the most exciting part of the evening. <laughs> okay, so this actually is, uh, I would like to call it a twofer, because it's not just a regulatory update, it's also a legislative update. Um, it's a legislative update that is impacting, that will be impacting uh, some a proceeding that's going on currently at the commission for the first slide. Um, so there have been a lot of budget bills that have been coming along. Um, there was this was a rider to um, the budget, and this was recently, um, you know, penned into law by the governor. This impacts cap and trade, and the cap and trade proceeding that's occurring at the commission right now. Essentially, what a little bit of background to cap and trade is that um, the California Air Resources Board or CARB. They have undertaken a regulation of greenhouse gases in California, and so this is currently being addressed with respect to energy at the California Public Utilities Commission. So what's happening right now is the mechanics are that there are three, in the early years of cap and trade, there are free allocations of emissions allowances to offset increased GHG costs associated with the program. Um, and in the case of electricity, in the IOU service territory, investor and utility service territories, those amounts are given to the distribution utility uh, on behalf of the generation providers in their service territory. So for example, community choice aggregators, um, the utility itself for its bundled customers, direct access providers. Um, and so this is this is sort of a kind of a, a pass through their they're passing through the funds uh, directly to us and how that's going to be done is being determined. However, um, what has happened in the Senate bill that was recently passed, 1018, first, um, there, the legislature has directed to whom those, the auctioned off revenues will go to, um, and they had to determined that that would be credited to residential, small business, and EITE, so emissions intensive trade exposed customers. Um, and so the idea is that would either be returned to those customers through the distribution rate, even though it's sort of a generation related um, cost and benefit, um, or through a non bypassable charge. So, what the legislation the impact of the legislation, though, is that municipal accounts will not receive the benefits of this. Um, large industrial water agencies and the like will not receive the benefits of this. So, for example, the University of California or um, the UC system or the uh, California state system would not receive you know, benefits of, of any rate reductions. Um, and the next 
part of this provision is the next section of this um, new public utilities code relates to the IOUs doing a customer outreach plan that would include bill notices and also media. So this, um, we want to be involved here in how this is implemented in the, in the GHG proceeding at the commission because the, the statute requires that this maximizes the public awareness of the crediting of GHG allowance revenues. But as noted, greenhouse gas costs and the associated benefits really relate to uh, the generation line item, so our function. So we need to ensure that marketing isn't happening by the distribution utility to our customers for something that really relates to our own operations. And then the last component of it relates back to um, energy efficiency and clean energy projects. Uh, and this would allow up to 15% of the auction revenues to be used for IOU administered clean energy and energy efficiency projects. And so obviously what we're going to need to have is clarity uh, from the commission as to what does that administration look like since they're generation related funds do those just pass through to the generation providers or how how is everybody equi equitably treated um, there are already carb regulations in place that require that ccas and other load serving entities be treated equally so, so even though the, the statute says iou it's the understanding administratively with the cca included. no no i because in the statute, it just says that it's you know it's the investor and utilities that are administering the fund. But what does administration mean? I don't think we know what that looks like yet. Um, administration could be a simple pass through. Administration could mean that the investor and utility would run, run programs. It's unclear how this would all you know overlay with the other existing programs. For example. Um, there's the expiry of the public goods charge, there's a new charge that's being, that in theory somewhat replaces the public goods charge, it's called the EPIC, um, and, you know, so how, how do all these, you know, there's public purpose program funds, how does it all interact? I don't think we know quite yet. Um, and so that, are, are there any more questions on that bit of legislation? I know that there are a lot of folks that are unhappy with the specific legislation and actually um, interestingly enough pg &E, um, came out in opposition to this these specific provisions and the concern there is that cca basically gets cut out of the of the residual funds because they're assigning it on the the distribution side instead of the gen side correct and so yeah i mean i think that you know there should be equitable treatment for the crediting to customers, because that would happen through either the distribution line item or through a non bypassable charge. And so, um, you know, the only concern there is are the correct, would the correct people really be receiving the benefit of this, you know, because it does exclude segments, um, you know, of, of rate pairs. Um, but, you know, that's pretty clear in the statute. And then for the customer outreach, the reason that that would be a concern for CCAs is you know, is this going to be marketing by the distribution utility to CCA customers? Um, and then the last one is, you know, what would administration of, you know, programmatic um, of clean energy or energy efficiency programs by an IOU, what would that look like? Would that look similar to IOU administration of other funds? Would it look would it be different because this really relates to a generation related you know, auction? Thank you. So I, I like to just raise a whole bunch of questions instead well, of giving you any answers. <coughs> so. Can you talk about the rationale for Bill 1018? So the why, why, why do we have it? Who benefits? Who doesn't? I mean, yeah. I so there know. there has been a a. Um, significant debate at the commission. Uh, the, the current president of the commission, um, Fisher Peavy, has indicated that he wanted a return to customers according to these guidelines, and so this conforms to his vision of how the funds would be expended. I don't know who 
who or what was the driving force behind we, this? Return money to, to the to who? To was residential it, customers. Say, residential customers. Residential. So the transmission side or generation side or both? Yeah, so the way that it, that it actually works is so when you're looking at the, the greenhouse gas costs that relate to um, that relate to the cap and trade system, you're really paying those costs when you're when you're purchasing the power. So for example, there would be a GHG cost associated with buying from a natural gas plant, but you wouldn't see those same costs from a solar plant because it's not producing any carbon. Um, and so the costs are being felt on the generation side. However, the way that the CARB regulations worked, and this is now how it's structured with this new legislation, is that the, the free allocations that are available at the beginning of the cap and trade program, which came off over time, those are actually, I would assume for administrative purposes, given to the distribution utility on behalf of all of the generation providers in its service territory. Um, and yeah, so but you know the, the provenance of the Senate I I don't mm -hmm. have an answer to that. Is there a PUC proceeding already open on it? Yes, there is, and we've been actively participating in that. Um, that has been in, that is on the second page of the regulatory update. Um, it's rulemaking eleven o three o one two, and so the. There's, so the first track of that relates to greenhouse gas allowance revenue allocation. And so that, you know, the reason why there's sort of nothing in this month is we're waiting for a proposed decision because we've gone through the entirety of the process, sort of the workshops and comments and reply comments and a real an iterative, iterative process on this specific topic. Um, but I don't know what the impact is going to be given the new legislation. Um, and then there's a second component which should not be impacted, which is the low carbon fuel standard credit revenue allocation. And so this relates to, for example, electric vehicles. So how do you how do you provide benefits and incentives for that? Um, but so we really want to stay on top of it. Yes, yes. And um, as I said, we've been actively participating um, and you know I think that there has been um, a lot of unhappiness from a lot of sectors on um, this specific piece of legislation, including, in, as I said, PG&E had opposed it. Um, the various folks that I've spoken to also have, are opposed to it. So I don't know if there will be legislative efforts to um, make improvements to or even remove these provisions, I, I don't know the answer to that. So I think it's just something that we'll be tracking over time to see how it plays out. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, go so, <laughs> on, that, on that, you know, I don't want to be a total downer. <laughs> um, there is um, also a new residential uh, rate rulemaking that we're gonna be tracking. Um, one of the interesting components here is um, that one of the key objectives in the new residential rate design um, relates to um, providing stability, simplicity, and customer choice. And so we will just be involved in the proceeding to ensure that, um, that CCA customers are, are treated fairly vis-a-vis uh, -vis bundled customers. Um, and so that is our primary involvement there. And the reason why this <coughs> This um, residential rulemaking is is being launched is really to address some legislation that was passed many years ago, um, Senate Bill 695, which really pegged the the rates of Tier One and Tier Two customers so that the fully bundled rate of those customers wouldn't rise above a certain amount. Um, what's happened though is those rates have stayed very low, but it shifts the cost to the tiers three and four, and there used to be tier five in PG service territory, now there's tier four. Um, and so it has become fairly inequitable for the upper upper classes there. Um, and so the question is how how do you how would that be corrected? And other 
issues that are being addressed in that rulemaking relate to um, costs associated with distributed generation. So right now, the, how the net energy metering works is you sort of get a discount on your on your transmission distribution costs, even though you're sort of you're, even though you're using those services. How much do you want to? You know, subsidize and encourage that versus folks pay, pay a fair share of cost there. Um, and what has been discussed um, in the in the rulemaking, uh, well, it's discussed to be discussed, um, is a transition away from just purely volumetric charges, so per kWh charge, and move towards you know possibly a per customer charge per residential. Um, so it's just something we'll be we'll be tracking and ensuring that CCAs are being fairly treated in the new rate design. Well, Steve and Diane are going to have a quiz on this. Uh -huh. Sure, sure. <laughs> I'm ready. Uh, thank you. But any questions on the best regulatory report? Is that it? <laughs> I mean, wow. I can I can talk all night. I know you can. Wrap it up here. Bottom line is this: all this is what always underscores we are in the utility. <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 So. Yeah. 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 Yeah.